The year was 1978, and I was twenty-something, itching to break free from my dead-end job in Kansas City. My name's Harlan, Harlan Tate, and the itch to explore had been with me since boyhood. So when a buddy mentioned working as a fire lookout in Yellowstone National Park, I jumped at the chance. The first few weeks were paradise. My office was a rickety tower overlooking a sea of green, the air crisp and pine-scented. I was alone for days on end, just me, the radio, and the endless expanse of wilderness. A bookworm like me could finally find some peace in the real world instead of between pages. Then came the evening that shattered everything. The sun was setting, turning the sky into a blaze of orange and pink. I'd just boiled water for some instant coffee when a flicker of movement below caught my eye. Three figures on horseback emerged from the trees along the valley floor. Two adults in worn park ranger uniforms, and between them, a kid. They waved up at me, the kid enthusiastic, the adults more reserved. Routine supply drop, most likely. Or maybe they were checking in on the greenhorn posted way out here. Either way, it broke the monotony. I waved back, and with a creak of old gears, cranked open the trapdoor on the tower's floor to shout down a greeting. That's when the forest exploded into chaos. A massive grizzly, easily twice the size of any I'd seen in orientation videos, lunged from the undergrowth directly beneath the horses. The rangers barely had time to react. One horse reared, its whinny cut short as the bear swiped a monstrous paw, toppling both horse and rider to the ground. Bear! Everyone scat dash! I started yelling into the radio. My voice died in my throat as the grizzly charged the other ranger and the kid. The kid's horse bolted, leaving him on the ground, eyes wide as dinner plates. My training kicked in. Snatching the rifle from its rack, I fumbled the safety off, aimed down through the trapdoor, and fired. The shot echoed through the valley. The bear flinched, then roared and raged. It left the ranger and swiveled toward the tower. That's when I got a good look at the damn thing. It's fur matted with blood, one eye milky and dead. Not just any grizzly, this was a survivor, a scarred veteran. I fired again. The bullet went wide, and the bear, undeterred, started climbing the tower's wooden supports. I fought a surge of nausea. No way the old timbers could hold its weight for long. Climb! I yelled down to the kid, who seemed frozen in terror. Get the hell up here! To his credit, he snapped out of it, scrambling towards the tower. The rangers were nowhere to be seen. Maybe they'd managed to get away. Maybe they were. I didn't let myself finish the thought. My aim was steadier when firing at a tree-climbing bear instead of fellow humans. The next two shots hit their mark. The grizzly snarled but kept coming. The kid reached the tower just as the first support beam snapped with a loud crack. He was halfway up the ladder when I heard the most awful sound I've ever heard a mix of tearing wood and a high-pitched scream cut short. I turned and saw the kid hanging upside down. The bear had its massive jaws clamped around his leg. Every twist and jerk of the child's body made the bear sway, putting even more pressure on the damaged tower. There was no time to think. I raised the rifle closed one eye, and aimed not at the monstrous bear, but at the slender strip of bloody flesh that was the kid's calf. It was the furthest point away I still needed to scare the damn thing off, not kill the kid. The gunshot nearly deafened me in the enclosed space. The boy screamed again, and to my horror, the tower lurched violently. Then, the kid dropped into the trees below followed a heartbeat later by an echoing roar. Silence fell over the valley, broken only by a distant whimpering that told me the kid was at least still alive. 
I stumbled back from the trapdoor, my hands shaking. Had I saved him? Or just prolonged the agony? Then another thought hit me. The bear was wounded, angry, and it knew exactly where I was. Retrieving the radio felt like moving through molasses. Bear attack! I shouted into the microphone, my voice breaking. South Valley Tower. Repeat, bear attack. One child injured, rangers missing. Send help. Static was my only reply. I tried again and again. Nothing. The isolation that had seemed like freedom hours ago now felt like a death sentence. Panic rose in my chest. I had some food, some water, a rifle with dwindling bullets, and no way to escape an enraged grizzly that was probably circling the base of my tower right now. Night fell, the forest below transforming into an inky black void. Every rustle, every twig snap, made me flinch. I forced myself to stay awake, to listen, knowing sleep could be fatal. I thought of the kid— his scared face, the mangled mess of his leg, and the rangers who'd ridden out to help and likely paid the price for it. A cold fury settled over me. I wasn't going to die cowering in this metal box. I was going to make that monster pay. By the time the first sliver of dawn broke, I had a plan, a desperate, stupid plan, but the only one I had left. The bear was wounded— but it had youth and raw power on its side. I had a high vantage point, some bullets, and the burning need for vengeance. I waited until the sun cast long shadows through the trees. Then, taking a deep breath, I opened the trapdoor and slowly, deliberately began to climb down. The world seemed to sway around me, every creak of wood felt like a death knell. When I was halfway down the ladder, I saw him. The grizzly was massive, even in the dim light, its scarred pelt rippling with muscle. It reared up, sniffing the air, then fixed its one good eye on me. A low growl rumbled through its chest, a promise of pain to come. And in that moment, something shifted. I wasn't scared anymore. I was just pissed. I let go of the ladder and dropped the remaining distance, landing with a grunt. The bear roared, a deafening sound that seemed to shake the very air around us. I scrambled back a few steps, eyes locked on my enemy, raising my rifle. But I didn't aim to kill. That moment, all I wanted was to make the damn thing hurt. My first shot hit its mark, tearing into the bear's thick shoulder. It staggered, then lunged with a speed that defied its size. I twisted, narrowly avoiding its claws. But the impact knocked me off balance, the rifle flying from my grasp. I hit the ground hard, the breath whooshing from my lungs. The bear loomed over me, its breath hot on my face, reeking of both blood and rot. I scrabbled with useless fingers at the dirt. This was it. Stupid, reckless, and about to end in a bloody mess at the base of my tower. And then I saw the knife. Not my hunting knife, that was lost somewhere in the fall. This was smaller, cruder, the bone handle worn smooth. The kid's knife, I realized. It must have fallen from his sheath during the struggle. My hand closed around the hilt. Not much but it was something. With a desperate roar of my own, I rolled. The bear's claws sliced through the air where my head had been a split second ago, ripping into the earth. Then I was on my feet, knife out, circling the wounded, enraged beast. It swiped at me again, and again I dodged, heart pounding in my ears. Now, it wasn't fear propelling me, but a desperate, reckless defiance. I thought of the rangers, the kid with his mangled leg, the bones of whatever poor creature this bear had turned into its last meal. My vision narrowed. There was just me, the bear, 
and this final, bloody dance. Its next lunge was clumsy, its injured shoulder slowing it down. I ducked under the massive paw, the knife slicing across its belly. The bear bellowed, rearing up in pain, a crimson streak blooming across its fur. That was my chance. Ignoring the instinct for self-preservation, I ran straight at it, the knife held high. The bear slashed out, aiming for my head. I threw myself sideways, pain exploding in my ribs as a massive claw raked across my side. Then I was past its defenses, right underneath its bulk. I plunged the knife upwards, burying it to the hilt in the soft flesh. The bear screamed, a deafening sound, and thrashed, twisting in a desperate attempt to dislodge me. I clung on, the world spinning, feeling the hot spray of blood. Then it collapsed. The ground shook with the impact. I rolled away, gasping, my vision fading in and out. The last thing I remember before blackness took me was the bear's form, still twitching, its lifeblood seeping into the thirsty soil. I woke up in a hospital bed, hooked up to tubes, the smell of antiseptic sharp in my nose. Had the rangers found me? somehow dragged me out of the wilderness. The events played on a hazy loop in my mind, the kids scream, the tower snapping, my own animal rage. A nurse in a crisp white uniform walked in, saw my eyes open, and smiled. Well, look who decided to rejoin the living, she said, her voice surprisingly chipper. You gave us all quite the scare, Mr. Tate. The story came out then, in bits and pieces between the doctor's visits and the painkillers. They'd found me barely breathing, the bear's carcass twenty feet away. The kid had somehow survived, a team finding him shivering beneath a fallen tree. Both my ribs and the kid's leg were broken, but there would be no lasting damage. We were the lucky ones. The rangers, though— no trace of them had ever been found. The papers called me a hero. Some local taxidermist even wanted the bear's hide as a trophy, an offer I refused with a shudder. But the truth I carried was much darker. It wasn't heroism that led me down that ladder, but blind fury. It was that same fury that kept me alive, a desperate gamble against impossible odds. When I finally returned to the rebuilt fire tower, it was with a newfound wariness. The wilderness wasn't just beautiful, it was brutal, and there were things lurking in its shadows far more dangerous than any grizzly. Turns out, the scariest monsters sometimes lurk within ourselves. Years later, I still dream of that day, the snapping timbers, the kids' terrified eyes, and the feeling of bone against my fist. Some nights, I wake in a cold sweat, convinced I can smell the bear's foul breath and hear the echo of its dying roar. Trauma lingers like a phantom ache. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I disagree. Sometimes, it just leaves you broken in different ways. The wilderness still calls to me, but now, there's an echo in its song a chilling note that wasn't there before. I lace up my hiking boots, but I never go alone. Even now, decades later, I keep looking over my shoulder, wondering if something else is out there, something the guidebooks don't warn about. I never saw its face in the dim light, but something tells me that bear was just a scout. And whatever came for the rangers— Whatever hunger and malevolence gleamed behind that milky eye, it might still be waiting, out there amongst the trees. Maybe it's a warped offshoot of nature, a creature the wildlife biologists have never catalogued. Or maybe there's a far darker truth to it, a predator that exists not in flesh and blood, but in the shadowy spaces where belief and reality blur. Sometimes, late at night, I think that whatever it was— it left a piece of itself in me that day, a sliver of wildness that might erupt again if the situation gets desperate enough. Because deep down, 
The thing I fear most isn't dying. It's surviving. The year was 1992. I was backpacking the Appalachian Trail solo. Name's Everett, Everett Knox. Thought it was about time I did something epic before cubicle life swallowed me whole. Trail life did have its perks fresh air, epic views, that feeling of being a tiny speck in a grand, untamed world. Day three into North Carolina, I set camp beside a creek, the trees closing in overhead. Something about it felt off, like I wasn't alone, even though I hadn't seen another soul for miles. Maybe just a case of the wilderness jitters, but that instinct had kept me safe more than once, even growing up in the backwoods of Tennessee. I was boiling water for supper when I saw the print. It wasn't any animal I recognized. Too big for a dog, too narrow for a bear. And there was something strange about the shape for toes, but longer than anything on a canine. I followed the prints until they vanished into the underbrush. Whatever made them was big and close. That night, I slept with my hunting knife clenched in my fist. Every rustle of leaves had me jerking awake. Come morning, I broke camp in record time determined to put some miles between me and whatever lurked out there. The trail wound deeper into the forest. The sunlight barely penetrated the canopy, leaving everything dim and dappled. With each step, the feeling of being watched intensified. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. All right, come on out! I shouted, spinning in a circle. Trail's big enough for both of us! I reckon. Silence. Then, a branch cracked, loud, somewhere behind me. I turned, the hairs on my neck standing on end. Nothing. Then a flicker of movement high in the trees. It was gone as soon as I saw it, just a hint of shadow against the leaves. Too high to be anything normal, and it moved wrong. I don't like this one bit. I muttered, picking up the pace. Had to be a big cat, a mountain lion maybe, pushed into human territory. Best to outrun it than corner it. That was backwards logic 101. The rest of the day passed in a tense blur. I was pushing myself hard, stopping only to chug water. I'd lost the trail somewhere back there, just crashing through the woods in the general direction I thought was north. By the time the sun began its descent, I was exhausted, lost, and good and spooked. Then I saw the lights. Not campfire lights, electric lights, flickering through the trees. Civilization. I stumbled toward them, relief washing over me. They were coming from a cabin, a small thing, barely more than a shack, tucked into a clearing. Smoke curled from a cobbled-together chimney, and I caught the whiff of roasting meat. My stomach rumbled in answer. Someone lived here, someone who could get me back on the trail. Hello? I called out, approaching cautiously. The door hung slightly open, held ajar by a crude wooden wedge. Anyone home? No answer. That hunger was twisting my guts and the light was starting to fade. My instincts were screaming at me to turn back, but the thought of another night out here was unbearable. I took a nervous step inside. The place was dim, everything rough-hewn, like someone built it themselves. On a makeshift table sat the remains of a meal, half a roasted rabbit carcass, bones picked clean, strips of torn raw meat. And beside it, Resting innocently against the chair leg was a bloody hunting knife. The blade was long, with a nasty-looking curve, not the type any normal hunter would have. That unease turned my insides to ice. Final warning, whoever's here, I yelled, backing toward the door. I'm armed, 
and I ain't afraid to use it. Then I heard it. A low, guttural sound. Not a growl, more like laughter. Coming from the far corner, swallowed by the shadows. I edged backwards just as a figure stepped into the dim light cast by the door. It was tall, freakishly tall, its head brushing the ceiling. At first, I thought it was a man, lean, dressed all in worn, ragged clothing. But as it moved closer, my blood ran cold. The limbs were too long, the joints bending in ways that weren't right. And its face. Lord, the face. Gaunt, sunken eyes like black pits, teeth filed into pointed shards. This wasn't a man. It was something that wore the rough shape of a man, like a crude costume. You come into my home, the creature rasped, its voice grating like nails on a chalkboard. Take my food. Now you pay. It took a step, the floorboards creaking ominously beneath its weight. My gun was in my pack, buried at the bottom. Didn't matter. Something this, unnatural, a bullet wouldn't do squat. I did the only thing left. I turned and ran. I heard branches snapping behind me, the things ragged breathing like a rusty saw. The forest was a blur of green and brown, my lungs burning. I tripped, stumbled, scrambled back up. I thought of that rabbit carcass, wondered if that was the last thing some poor hiker saw before becoming the monster's dinner. I wasn't going to let that be my fate. A root snagged my foot, and I went down hard. The thing was on me in seconds, those impossibly long fingers reaching for my throat. I rolled, scrabbling in the dirt for anything to use as a weapon. My hand closed around a rock. Without thinking, I swung, smashing it into the side of the creature's head. An ear-splitting shriek echoed through the trees, and the creature recoiled, clutching the side of its face. Blackish blood trickled between its fingers. Surprise, then rage contorted its monstrous features. I scrambled to my feet, not looking back. It might be wounded, but something told me that wouldn't stop it for long. The forest was my enemy, each shadow a potential hiding place for the creature, every snap twig its approaching footsteps. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt ready to collapse. Yet, the adrenaline coursing through me was its own kind of fuel, pure, desperate terror. It was getting darker. I had to find somewhere to hide, somewhere to catch my breath and think. Then... A flicker of hope a hollowed-out tree trunk, wide enough for me to squeeze into. It was dark and cramped, smelling of damp rot, but it was concealment. I wedged myself inside, heart pounding against my ribs. The creature's ragged breathing echoed through the forest, getting closer, then fading, then circling back. It was smart, toying with me, its own twisted version of hunter and prey. Minutes stretched into eternity. Each time a branch cracked outside, I flinched, cold sweat prickling my spine. Outside, the forest grew silent. Had it given up? Or was it just waiting, listening for my panicked breaths? I didn't know how long I'd been curled in that wretched tree trunk, my body cramping, my mind teetering on the edge of hysteria. Then I saw it. Two pinpricks of malevolent light in the darkness, moving slowly toward my hiding place. No time for hesitation. I burst from the tree, sprinting blindly through the forest. I ran until I had nothing left, then stumbled and collapsed, gasping for breath. My pursuer wasn't far behind, its rasping laughter echoing through the night. I scrambled up again my legs screaming in protest. Lungs on fire, I burst through the tree line and stumbled onto a dirt road. In the growing dawn light, I could make out a faded wooden sign, National Park Boundary, five miles. I might actually make it out alive. 
The rest of the journey was a blur. Every time the underbrush rustled, I thought the creature had caught up. But those pinpricks of light never reappeared. Finally, I reached the ranger station and collapsed, barely able to get the words out. They stared at me, the ranger, wide-eyed, and a lone trucker who'd pulled in for coffee. My clothes were torn, my face streaked with dirt and blood. I must have looked like I'd escaped from the asylum. But they didn't doubt my story, not really. They'd heard the rumors, whispers of strange sightings, of animals hunted in ways that defied explanation. Local lore dismissed as tall tales. A search party went out with me, armed with rifles and tracking dogs. They found my campsite, torn apart animal tracks overlaid with those strange four-toed prints, impossibly large. They followed the trail of broken branches until it abruptly vanished deeper into the wilderness. Eventually, they had to call it off. No body, no evidence, nothing but a half-crazed hiker's story. The report chalked it up to a possible wild animal attack, bear or cougar gone rogue. Easier to swallow than the alternative, especially when that alternative sounds like a damn horror movie pitch. It's been years now, but time hasn't dulled the memory. I don't hike anymore, can't stomach the smell of wood smoke or the sight of a dense tree line. Even in the city, I feel eyes on me, see shadows shifting at the edge of my vision. Sometimes, I wake up in a cold sweat hearing that grating laughter, the rustle of leaves behind me. News filters in occasionally. A hiker goes missing in a national park, body never recovered. A mutilated animal carcass is found high in the mountains, killed in a way that baffles experts. I see the same unspoken question in the eyes of the newscasters, echoed in the online forums dedicated to the unexplained. Something's out there lurking in those liminal spaces between forest and civilization. People call me crazy, say the trauma warped my mind. Maybe they're right. Or maybe I'm the only sane one left, the only one who saw the true shape of the wilderness. That creature in the cabin wasn't a mutated man, nor a starving beast. It was something older, wilder, a remnant of a time before trails and maps and the illusion of human control. Something the old stories hinted at, whispered warnings about the dark things that devour those who wander off the beaten path. The woods call to me sometimes. There's a part of me, a reckless part, that wants to go back, armed to the teeth this time, and hunt the hunter. Prove to the world, or at least to myself, that what I saw was real. But the memory of that night, the cold glint in those inhuman eyes is enough to smother the impulse. I'm not a hero or a madman. Just a guy who knows something lurks in the shadows, something with pointed teeth and a hunger for those foolish enough to venture into its territory. Maybe it's a feral throwback, a lone survivor of a species long thought extinct. Or maybe it's a creature of folklore, something that's whispered about in hushed tones around dying campfires. The truth is, I don't care what it is. All I know is this, it's out there. Waiting. Watching. And the next time someone goes missing in the deep woods, their half-eaten corpse discovered amidst the tracks of an unknown beast. Well, at least the world will know I wasn't lying. The year was 2008, and I was through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt Lawson. Bit of a nature nut, always craving big open skies after too long living in cramped city apartments. This was the epic adventure four months from Mexico to Canada, just me, my pack, and the wilderness stretching out ahead. Days on the PCT blurred together. Sunrises over mountain peaks, 
blisters, nights curled under impossibly starry skies. Found a kind of rhythm, a way of just existing in the moment. But even in that peace, you learn to watch your back. Nature might be beautiful, but she's also ruthless. About halfway through Oregon, I hit a long stretch of remote forest. Thick green canopy, trails so narrow I could barely squeeze through with my pack. Days passed without seeing another soul. That should have felt like paradise, the pure solitude. Instead, unease pricked at me. A sense of wrongness. Then came the noises. Nothing out of the ordinary at first snapping twigs, rustle of leaves. But there was a pattern to them, circling me, keeping pace just out of sight. Birds didn't move like that, either did squirrels or deer. This was a predator, something big. And smart. I kept up my hiking pace, pretending it wasn't happening, pretending the sweat down my back was just from the heat. Took to singing a loud off-key, anything to break the unnatural silence. It didn't work. Whatever was stalking me, it kept following. The night it got serious. I picked a campsite as defensible as I could find, a clearing against a rocky slope. Laid out my stuff, forced myself to eat, but those rustling sounds kept me on edge. As dusk fell, I finally saw it. Just a glimpse, a massive shape, bulky and hunched, slinking between the trees at the edge of the firelight. It was upright, but wrong, the limbs too long. For just a second, I saw its face, and I will never unsee that. All teeth and gleaming eyes, a twisted parody of something human. Go away! I yelled at it, brandishing my trekking pole like an idiot. No response, except it moved closer, staying just within the shadows. Damn it! Leave me alone! It took all my willpower not to break and run. My rational brain kept saying cougar, a big one gone rogue. But cougars don't stalk for days, don't circle like that. And that face, pure nightmare fuel. I built the fire up, a desperate attempt to ward off the darkness. The night stretched into an eternity. The creature paced around just out of sight, occasionally letting out a low, guttural moan that vibrated through my whole body. It was playing with me, a cat with its half-dead prey. Terror choked me. I didn't sleep a wink. When dawn finally painted the treetops pink, the thing was gone. There were tracks circling my campsite, monstrous footprints like nothing I'd seen in the guidebooks. I packed up in record time, heart slamming against my ribs, and got the hell out of there. The rest of the hike was a haze. I kept expecting to see that hulking shape lurking behind every tree. Every nighttime rustle had me leaping up. I told some other hikers, got pitying looks and whispers about exhaustion-induced hallucinations. Even I doubted what I saw, except for the bone-deep fear that clung to me long after I reached Canada. Years later, I still think back to those Oregon woods. My life's back to normal, whatever that is. Job, apartment, the usual grind. But sometimes, the city feels too crowded, too safe. I get the itch for wide open spaces. Then I'll see a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye, or smell a whiff of something foul and earthy on the breeze, and I remember. They say there's no Bigfoot, no unexplained creatures left in the world. That everything that walks this earth has been documented and categorized. The creature in those woods. I don't know what the hell it was. But I know this. The wilderness is a lot bigger and less knowable than we like to think. Some nights, I think I hear a tapping at my apartment window. I never look. Some things are better left unseen. Lately, I've taken up running in the local park. I stay on the paved paths, well-lit, crowded. Maybe if something else is out there, 
it'll think I'm not worth the trouble. Or maybe it's biding its time, waiting till I get that itch for wilderness again. Waiting to see if I'm foolish enough to venture back into its territory. One day, I might be. It's crazy, I know. But out there, facing that primal fear again, maybe it would be better than this cowardly half-life. Maybe it would feel like facing the truth, even if that truth is monstrous. After all, sometimes I see that same monster reflected back at me in the mirror, a creature made timid and small by the modern world. And what's scarier than the beast in the woods? Dying in a cage, never knowing if something wild still lurks out there in the shadows, waiting to be rediscovered. It was early 1988 when I told my buddies I was going back out to the Superstition Mountains. You know, the ones out in Arizona folks whisper about. Where the lost Dutchman gold mines rumored to be hidden. They shook their heads, said those mountains held more than gold. Truth be told, I needed a break from the city grind. Crave the quiet, the wide open spaces only those dusty peaks could give me. My name's Randall, by the way. Randall Kittner. First two days were heaven. Sunbaked silence stretching for miles. A buzzard my only companion circling in the sapphire sky. Nights, my campfire crackled, stars exploding overhead. City life felt impossibly far away. But on the third morning, I stumbled on something that sent a prickle down my spine. A backpack ripped open near the trail. Faded denim, looks like it had been there a while. My heart quickened. Out here, anything out of place is a bad sign. I circled, scanning the ground. That's when I saw it. Drag marks. Scuffs in the hard-packed dirt leading away from the bag. Not animal tracks too wide, too purposeful. Suddenly... Something about the quiet was off, like the air was holding its breath. I shouldn't have been alone. That was the first whisper of fear in the back of my mind. Hello? I called out, my voice shaky. Nobody answered, of course. Just the wind whistling past the saguaro. I knelt, examined the marks. Deep grooves, whoever or whatever made them was heavy big. That fear turned into a rock in my gut. Maybe a bear? But the size didn't feel right, and why tear open a backpack? It dawned on me, the bag looked kind of chewed. Panic prickled my skin. Time to leave. I'd heard the local stories. Mountain lions. Hermits losing their minds. Worse, those whispers of skinwalkers— Navajo legends I couldn't fathom. Still, I told myself there was probably a logical explanation. Just then, I heard a snap. A twig breaking behind me. I spun. Nothing. Just the spiky shadows of mesquite dappled across the sand. Sweat trickled down my temple. I grabbed my pack and walked back to camp. Didn't even look behind me. My mind was racing. Had something been watching me the whole time? Next morning, my camp was wrecked. The fire pit scattered, my supplies shredded like an animal had ripped through them. That's when the certainty took root. This wasn't a beast. This was deliberate. My chest tightened. Someone was out there. My joke to the bartender back home, about the mountains being haunted— now felt less funny. I considered heading back, but stubbornness took over. Randall Kittner wasn't going to be chased off by some shadow in the hills. I patched up camp best I could, my hands trembling. I needed proof. That night, I set up my old trail cam, pointing it towards the treeling. I didn't sleep a wink, waiting for something. I didn't know what— Morning came, 
and I found the trail cam on the ground, lens cracked. Furious, my pulse pounded in my ears. This was messed up. Someone was playing games. I scanned the footage, hoping against hope I'd caught something. Blurry shots of brush, my tent fluttering in the breeze. Nothing. Then, that last shot before the camera smashed. My blood ran cold. There, in a split-second blur, a shape. Massive, hunching low on two legs, yet not fully human. Dark, ragged fur. Huge eyes reflecting the flash. It was gone, vanishing into the rocks. I stared at the image, the scale of the thing barely fitting on the screen. I didn't know what I was seeing. Some local hoax with a gorilla suit? One of those skinwalker things, if they were even real? Nothing made sense. I sat there all day, staring at the mountains, my rifle in my lap. By dusk, the fear was like a physical weight crushing me. This thing out here, it wasn't playing games anymore. It wanted me to know it was there. My hands shook as I packed, stumbling through the motions. There was no way I was staying another night. As I hiked, I checked behind me every few steps. Every rustle of leaves had me ready to bolt. I had to get to my truck, get out of this nightmare. But with each mile, the mountains closed in, a dark labyrinth I couldn't escape. The sun was dipping when I heard it. A growl. Low, guttural. It echoed off the rocks, surrounding me, like the damn mountain itself was growling at my back. I spun around, rifle raised, heart pounding so loud I couldn't hear anything else. It lunged from the shadows, a monstrous blur of muscle and teeth. I fired more from panic than aim. The roar cut off in a choked gurgle. For a second, there was only silence and the smell of gunpowder. Then a thud. It landed hard a few feet away. It wasn't alone. My fingers fumbled for another shell, but there were too many. Three, four, more shapes circling from the twilight. Their eyes glowed like embers in the gathering dark. I fired again and again. One went down with a snarl, but it didn't stop them. This was no group of feral animals. There was a grim intelligence in the way they moved, how they didn't charge blindly. I backed away, stumbling over rocks, gunshots echoing until the rifle clicked empty. I tossed it aside, useless now. They were closing in, the stench of them heavy in the air. Then, from the leader, a hiss. It sounded almost human. The hiss wasn't just animal noise, it was a warning. A flash of terrible understanding hit me. These things weren't mindless predators. This was a hunt, and I was the prey. Their leader, the one I'd shot, was still alive, dragging itself along on shattered limbs. It barked another guttural command, and the others fanned out, cutting off my escape routes. I was trapped. Desperation fueled me. I grabbed a rock, chucked it with all my might. It cracked one of the glowing eyes clean out. The creature howled, blind and enraged, thrashing against its own pack. That bought me a few precious seconds. I scrambled up a steep incline, a jumble of boulders my only chance. They scrambled after me, claws scraping against rock. I clawed upwards, panic and adrenaline pushing me. Sweat stung my eyes, my breath ragged in my throat. A clawed hand snagged my heel, ripped at my boot. I kicked back with my good leg, blind terror giving me a surge of strength. My attacker yowled and tumbled back down the slope. I reached the top, a flat outcrop that overlooked the valley. Below, more shapes circled the base of the rocks, their eyes burning up at me. There was nowhere else to run. My heart pounded so hard I could hardly breathe. This was it. 
I was gonna die out here in this godforsaken desert. Then, the most unlikely sound split the air. Sirens. Distant, but getting louder. A wave of hope crashed over me. Rescue. Civilization. I slumped against the rock, gasping for breath. The creatures went still, then melted back into the shadows like they'd never been there. It took the rescuers hours to find me. I was battered, bruised, and half delirious. They told me I was lucky. A group of hikers had seen flashes from my gunshots and called it in. Said they couldn't believe anyone was this far into the mountains. Told me that part of the superstitions was closed off local tribes' land or something. I hadn't seen any signs, too focused on what was behind me, not on maps. The aftermath was a whirlwind. The police, a ranger from the reservation, even some reporter hotshot type trying to get the story. What did I see? What were they? Nobody believed me. Animal attack, they said. Maybe drug-addled loner got me riled up. I even started to question myself. Maybe it was the isolation, the fear. But the paramedics, they found the bodies. Two monstrous things torn apart by gunfire. They didn't look like any bear or mountain lion I'd ever seen. The story never hit the papers. Got hushed up, just another desert mystery. But I know what I saw. Still see them in my nightmares sometimes. I never went back to the superstitions. City life ain't so bad after all. But there's a part of me, deep down, that wonders. What else is out there, in the shadows? What lurks on the fringes of the maps, in those forgotten canyons? Did that tribe know about the creatures? Were they protecting the land, or protecting us from it? The answers are lost in the blowing sand, carried by the same desert winds that almost took my life. I carry the scars, the story, and the haunting knowledge that we share this world with things far older and stranger than we can imagine. Sometimes, at night, when the city noise dies down, I swear I hear a distant howl echoing off the walls of my apartment. They say those who've brushed with death see the world differently. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm a little crazy now, a little paranoid. But even with crowds all around me, I never feel truly alone. See, the thing out in those mountains, it taught me something. We don't own this world. We're just visitors, and the wilds. The wilds are far, far bigger than any map can show. Sometimes, I think, maybe that monstrous thing, that leader, maybe it let me go. People ask if I'd ever go back. Search for answers. Find proof. No. No, I don't think so. Some things are better left unknown. Some mysteries are better left in the dark. I figure it was a werewolf tribe, the leader of ferocious Alpha protecting his territory. After all, it was out there I became a hunted animal, forced to face the raw, brutal heart of nature. Turns out, the real monsters might not be the ones with fangs and fur after all. The trip to the Olympic National Forest in 92 was supposed to be a reset. You know, unwind after wrapping a nasty divorce, get back into the groove with old buddies. Me, I'm Tyson, Tyson Lowell. Ex-lawyer, middle-aged, and needing some damn trees to clear my head. My pals, Danny, all-around good dude with a laugh that could wake the dead. And Mark, the ever-skeptic, wildlife biologist type. We hit the whole river trail, aiming for a week in those mossy depths. Day two, and the forest got real. We'd left the crowds behind trails blurring into barely used tracks ferns like giant hands brushing your legs, sunlight dappling through leaves the size of dinner plates. 
marks the type to stop every few feet, some mushroom, or a bird call I sure as hell couldn't identify. While Danny and I ribbed him, the air easy between us. It happened that afternoon. One minute, Danny and Mark were up ahead, bantering about Sasquatch or whatever they got into. The next, there was a yell. Not a human yell, nothing I could even place at first. Like a bear caught in a trap, but raw, mixed with a kind of fury I didn't understand. We ran. Not smart, I know, but instinct kicks in. Then there was another sound, a wet, ripping sound, and Danny, he let out a choke scream, cut off sharp. By the time Mark and I crashed through the undergrowth, it was silent. Except for the dripping. Danny wasn't there. Not his body, not a damn drop of blood. His backpack lay torn open, supplies scattered across the overgrown trail like a sick joke. Mark and I just stared at each other, the shock numbing everything else. We shouted for Danny, voices swallowed by the green vastness. I think deep down, we knew there was no point. Whatever had snatched him, it was gone. We debated. Do we go back, call for help? Or look for our buddy, even if what's left probably wouldn't be much to find? Mark, face tight, said we keep moving. Danny wouldn't want us to risk it. Besides, we didn't know if whatever took him was still out there, watching. We hiked till dark a forced march fueled by fear and guilt. Camp was a tense silence broken only by Mark muttering about animal attacks, trying to rationalize the impossible. I didn't say a word. In my gut, I knew that wasn't any ordinary predator. I'd seen true crime stuff, read the stories. This felt different. Wrong. The next day, we radioed for help. Our voices must have sounded cracked, insane, because the rangers on the line questioned us like we were losing it. Lost friend, no sign of struggle, no tracks they could follow. We backtracked, a ranger with us this time, but found nothing. Not a trace of Danny. The ranger exchanged a long look with Mark, the unspoken question hanging between them. Were we lying? covering something up? That night, I dreamt of Danny, saw him disappearing into the trees as his scream echoed through my skull. But in the dream, it wasn't just trees. Towering above them was a shape. Massive, impossibly tall, hunched on spindly legs like a nightmare spider. Its head jerked towards me, and even though the features were blurred, I felt, recognized. I woke up sweating, Mark snoring a few feet away. I didn't mention the dream, didn't mention the way my skin prickled even in the safety of our tent. There were no answers out here, only the cold reality that Danny was gone, and the lingering horror that something monstrous, something impossible, lurked in these ancient woods. The rest of the trip is a blur. Rangers combing the area, no further sign of trouble. Us getting questioned, the undertone of disbelief growing with each fruitless search. Back home, Danny's face was on the news, then faded, another unsolved disappearance. Mark and I went our separate ways, the bond between us broken by the unspoken. Years passed. I moved around, changed jobs, tried to forget the forest and its terrible secrets. But some nights, I hear Danny scream again, and I see that towering shape in the half-light between sleep and wakefulness. Its form shifts, never fully clear, but the feeling of being watched, hunted, that lingers. Sometimes, in those dark hours, I think Mark was right. It must have been an animal, one we haven't cataloged yet, a relic species the world forgot. But then there's that chilling certainty, the knowledge that whatever took Danny was intelligent. It knew what it was doing, and maybe, just maybe, it waited until we were alone.
The summer of 77, my last hurrah before college, was supposed to be about camping under California redwoods and flirting with girls on the boardwalk. You know, the whole coming-of-age bit. Me, I'm Ezra Klein, outdoors a type, more at home in boots than books. Little did I know this trip would leave a mark far darker than any sunburn. My buddies, Will and Cal, were the impulsive kind. Dude, let's deter to Big Basin, Cal declared one morning, all surfer tan and charm. Will, always up for adventure, was already nodding. Me, I hesitated. Those woods had a reputation, stories about old logging camps and hikers gone missing. But hey, I was seventeen and dumb enough to crave a taste of danger. We went off trail pretty quick. The redwood soared, impossibly huge, sunlight barely breaking through the canopy. We joked, trying to shake off a creeping unease. Something about the silence felt off. No birdsong, no rustle of critters, just the crunch of our boots on the needle-strewn path. And the smell, earthy, but with a hint of something rotten underneath. Afternoon came, the woods growing darker. It was Cal, always the jokester, who went quiet first. Will and I followed his gaze, and there it was, a deer carcass, half hidden in the ferns. Not just dead, but ripped apart, like some giant beast had feasted. My skin itched. This was beyond any coyote. Time to head back, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. Will agreed, but Cal, the stubborn fool, insisted we press on. He swore there was an abandoned cabin nearby, the perfect spooky story locale. An hour later, with the light turning that weird dusky gray, we stumbled upon it. The cabin was straight out of a horror flick, sagging roof, boarded up windows, an aura of decay that made my neck hair stand on end. Cal, of course, was thrilled. Will looked less enthusiastic and I just wanted the hell out of there. But before I could argue, we heard it. A growl. Deep, guttural, echoing off the monstrous trees. We froze. My heart pounded so loud I figured whatever was out there could hear it too. Then, a flash of movement in the undergrowth. Cal swore, his voice barely a whisper. Will grabbed my arm, his grip bruising. I closed my eyes, then forced myself to look. It was massive. Shambling on four legs, hunched, it's for a mottled mess of browns and black. Too big to be a bear, and its snout, elongated, almost wolf-like, but wrong. Its eyes burned red in the gloom, fixed on us with a predatory intelligence that made my stomach churn. We gotta run. I hissed, the words coming out choked. Cal fumbled for his pocket knife, a pathetic weapon against whatever that thing was. Will was already backing away, scrambling over deadfall. I followed, the creature's snarl at my heels. We crashed through the trees, branches clawing at us. I didn't dare look back, just ran until my lungs were on fire, the taste of blood in my throat. We burst onto the main trail just as dusk fell. Headlights blinded us, a ranger truck. We babbled, tripping over each other to describe the creature, the carcass. The rangers exchanged a look, the skepticism clear on their faces. Probably a sick bear, one said dismissively. Stick to the marked pads, boys. But back at the campground, staring into the campfire, I saw that monster in the dancing flames. Will and Cal tried to explain it away, shadows playing tricks, overactive imaginations. Deep down, though, I knew. Nobody in that truck believed us, and out here, in the vastness of those woods, there was nobody to save us if that creature came hunting again. When dawn finally came, we packed up in record time. The redwoods, once so majestic, now seemed menacing. I didn't look back as we drove away, 
but the fear clung to me long after the trees disappeared from view. Some nightmares you can't escape, even in the full light of day. Some years back, I saw a news article, another hiker vanished in Big Basin, no trace ever found. I wonder sometimes if they saw that monstrous shape too, lurking in the ancient shadows. I wonder, and I try to forget. Part of me suspects that whatever dwells in those woods, it's far older and more cunning than we can comprehend, a beast from the fringes of campfire tales. I figure I was lucky to get out alive. Then again, maybe the creature has a long memory, and one day it'll come looking for the one who escaped. Back in 93, I was a park ranger in Zion National Park. Young, idealistic, thought I'd spend my days watching sunsets and rescuing lost tourists. Name's Micah, Micah Jensen. Turns out, the wilds have teeth, and I almost lost mine out there. That summer was a scorcher. Hikers dropping like flies from heat stroke, folks getting cocky and getting into trouble. August hit, and I had the graveyard shift, checking remote trails, the stuff tourists mostly don't touch. Figured it'd be a peaceful few weeks before fall when the crowds came back. I was dead wrong. One trail led deep into Kalob Canyon, a narrow slot with towering sandstone walls. Even at night, with just my flashlight beam cutting the dark, it felt claustrophobic. Up on the cliffs, I'd catch the glint of eyes, coyotes, owls, the usual. Made the hair on my neck prickle, but nothing out of the ordinary. Then, the stink hit me. Rotting meat, but with a sickly sweet edge that turned my stomach. I radioed base camp, got the standard probably a dead deer, keep an eye out response. Didn't convince me, not with that smell hanging thick in the air. I crept further in, flashlight shaking. Found the source soon enough a hiker's backpack, torn to shreds, contents scattered. No body, thank God, but blood. And something else. Claw marks raked across the rock, bigger than any bobcat I had ever seen. First snagged on a branch, coarse and gray-brown. A flash of panic shot through me. Mountain lion territory, maybe? But lions were lean. Lithe hunters, not whatever ripped into this poor sod's gear. Before I could examine things closer, the radio crackled. Micah, report. It was base camp, a note of worry beneath the official tone. All clear, I lied. Looks like some unlucky dude got lost, left his pack behind. I pocketed the first sample, figuring I'd run it by a biologist on my way back. The worst decision of my life. The rest of the patrol was off. Kept hearing rustling noises that my flashlight couldn't pin down. And the eyes, more than usual, reflecting the beam in pairs, from higher up than any coyote should be. The canyon felt like it was closing in, choking me. I pushed on, cursing my stubborn streak a mile long. Should have turned back but pride is a dangerous thing in the middle of nowhere. By the time I reached the turnaround point, I was swearing with every step. Rocks crumbling beneath my boots, weird shifting shadows that played tricks on my eyes. Just as I convinced myself it was just nerves, the canyon walls lit up. Not with my flashlight. Dozens of eyes, glowing yellow. And they were descending, my training kicked in. Radio in one hand, I fumbled for the flare gun with the other. Base, this is Ranger Jensen. Massive animal presence in Kalab, unidentified. I repeat, unidentified. Wreck. I never finished. Something slammed into me from behind, the force bowling me over. I fumbled, catching a glimpse of sheer size, coarse fur, and teeth. 
a lot of teeth. Then the radio was ripped from my hand, crunching under those monstrous jaws. I fired the flare, more out of desperation than strategy. There was a shriek that reverberated through the canyon, cut short with a wet thud. The stench intensified, making me gag. I scrambled up, vision blurry, but the eyes had retreated momentarily. Whatever it was, the flare had hurt it. That was my only chance. I ran. Never been much of a sprinter, but fear turned me into a damn Olympian. The thing snarled behind me, the sound echoing through my skull. I tripped, stumbled, slammed my shoulder against the canyon wall, tasting blood, but there was no time to stop. Ahead, the canyon mouth was a beacon. If I could just reach it. Branches slashed at my face, clawed feet tore gashes in my backpack. I sobbed, a stupid, panic sound that was just a step above pure animal terror. The thing was closer, its breath hot and foul on my neck. I risked a glance back and saw it clearly for the first time. Hulking on four legs, bigger than any bear, matted fur bristling. Those eyes, they burned with an intelligence that was crueler than any predator instinct. I didn't understand then, but I do now. It was toying with me. I burst out of the canyon, collapsing on the dirt path. Sobbing, retching, I fumbled for the radio, only to realize it was long gone. I was trapped. But the creature, whatever it was, didn't follow. It stayed just within the shadow of the canyon entrance, a silhouette monstrous and unmoving. I crawled backwards, dragging myself towards the main trail, hope a fading flicker in my gut. The sun was just starting to peek over the horizon when a search party found me. I babbled my story, the first sample clutched in my fist. They looked at me like I was crazy. Mountain lion, they said. Heat exhaustion. Trauma. Nobody believed me about the eyes, the size the damn cunning of it. I quit the rangers soon after. Turns out, some things aren't worth seeing twice. City life ain't so bad, even with the crowds. But some nights, I swear I smell that rotting sweetness, and I hear the low rumble of a growl outside my window. Makes me double-check the locks, maybe keep a baseball bat close by just in case whatever haunts Kalab Canyon decides to come calling. I've been hiking since I was a kid. Started out on little nature trails when I was six, and by the time I was 18, I was taking on some major climbs. It's 1978 now and I've got some decent peaks under my belt. My name's Kellen, Kellen Voss. Yeah, kind of a weird name. Parents weren't hippies, they were just unique. So, unique name, an even more unusual hobby for a guy. I always preferred hiking alone, but it's smart to be safe, you know? That's why I always let my roommate know where I'm going. Last hike was in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Gorgeous in the spring, and I had a hunch there might be a new route. I told Rick, my roommate, I was checking out an old logging trail west of Klingman's Dome. I figured two days to get off the beaten path, two back on familiar territory. Started out just like any other hike. Gears the same as always, worn in boots, Backpack with food, water, basic safety stuff, my little camping kit. Always the camping kit. You never know when you might need to stop for the night. The first day of hiking the logging trail wasn't as great as I'd hoped. Thick tree cover, no wildlife to spot, and worst of all, no vistas. The Appalachian vistas are part of the payoff for me, so that was a bummer. By the second day... The logging trail petered out, which wasn't a surprise. It was an old route, 
and nature takes its course. I decided to keep going, though. There was a small creek nearby, so I knew I could follow that for a while and be okay for water. No trails meant I was really off the grid, more than I'd planned for initially. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't panic time yet. That's why it was so jarring when I stumbled into the clearing. Seemed out of nowhere, one second, thick trees, damp, undergrowth, the usual. The next, it was like someone had cut a perfect circle out of the forest. Grass, open space up to a ring of trees at the far end. And in the dead center of that clearing, a cabin. Now I've seen old logging camps before. This wasn't that. Too big to be a temporary thing and something about it pricked my senses wrong. Maybe it was how well kept it seemed, no moss, would looked practically fresh. Maybe it was the total silence. Not a single bird call, no whine through the leaves. I know I should have followed that instinct. Should have hightailed it out of there, back on a rough track if I had to, just to put that weird cabin behind me. But I've got this curious streak that's both a blessing and a curse sometimes. And that curse is what won out in that moment. Before I knew it I was crossing the clearing. The cabin, up close, was less threatening, but still wrong. Windows looked too clean, doors seemed almost too sturdy. No chimney either, now that I was paying attention. Maybe whoever used it packed out their trash and maybe there was a stovepipe too small for me to see at that angle. But something whispered to the survivalist part of my brain that this wasn't an abandoned logging shack. And that whispering got a whole lot louder when the door creaked open. There, in the doorway, was a man. Six and a half feet tall easy, and broad with it. Had an old-timey lumberjack beard, but the clothes were wrong for that image. Black jeans, black boots, looked almost like a modern military style. But his face. I'm not good with descriptions, but I'll try. Picture the type of guy that kids run from on sight. Mean look in his eyes, scarred up, features like they'd been smashed too many times and healed uneven. And something about the way he was built, too lean, too much muscle for his frame like an animal that's been starving. He didn't say nothing. Just looked at me, with this intensity that made my skin crawl. I'm not a little guy, but I felt small with him staring me down. I guess some primordial sense finally kicked in, cause I turned to run. That's when I heard it. Not from the man, from behind me. A crack of a branch like something huge had snapped it. I spun, already knowing the clearing wasn't as empty as it first seemed. Out of the tree line lumbered a thing. No way to describe it well. Massive, like easily eight feet at the shoulder. Black fur, matted, and the head, God, the head. Like a wolf but warped, jaw too big, eyes the wrong color, this weird yellow that glowed even in the afternoon sun. Instinct had me moving again, the cabin my only goal now. The man was still in the doorway, hadn't moved an inch. I swear, for a second, it looked like he almost smiled. Didn't have time to dwell on that as the creature behind me let out a roar that shook the ground. I was at the cabin door, fumbling for the handle. Behind me, I could hear the creature gaining, its claws ripping through the dirt. I don't know what I expected. Maybe the door to be locked. Maybe the man would refuse to let me in. Instead, the door swung inward, and he was there, hand outstretched, hauling me in just as the creature reached the cabin's porch. The door slammed shut, and I scrambled back. Heard wood splintering, the creature bashing against the cabin. And then, silence. I was panting, heart in my throat, but outside the cabin, not a sound. I turned to look at the man. He was at one of the windows, peering out. What the hell was that? 
I rasped out the only question that mattered. Not a question you want the answer to, kid. He turned away from the window. You got water? Uh, yeah. I fumbled for my pack, took a long swig. Food, too? Yeah, couple days' worth. He nodded, went to the other window, scanning the tree line. Good. That'll buy us some time. Time for what? My voice cracked, the absurdity of the situation hitting me full force. One minute hiking alone, the next holed up in a creepy cabin with a psycho and a monster outside. Time to figure out how to get you out of here alive. The man pointed out a single, dusty bedroll. Get some sleep. You're gonna need it. Sleep was the furthest thing from my mind, but my body was operating on pure adrenaline and I knew I'd crash eventually. That bedroll wasn't promising, but it beat the hard floor. I laid down, facing the far wall, hoping to avoid looking at the boarded-up windows or the heavy, scarred door. Every creak of old wood had me jerk awake. Was the creature still out there? Was it just waiting? The man stayed by the windows, peering out into the darkness. My thoughts spun, trying to process what I'd seen. A feral beast, a monster out of a nightmare. Was that what my hike had led me to? The hours went by like that, my mind a mess of fear and desperate attempts at logic. Whatever that beast was, the man in the cabin clearly knew more than he was letting on. Who was he? living off-grid like this. And why hadn't he been attacked? Must have dozed off at some point, cause suddenly sunlight was filtering through a crack in the boards. My blood ran cold, expecting the creature to be waiting, but the forest was quiet. I glanced at the man, still watching. Can we get out of here? I couldn't stay trapped any longer. Maybe. He looked more tired than I felt, with circles etched beneath his hard eyes. If we're lucky, it'll have moved on. We gotta move fast, though. He explained his plan while we scarfed down some of my trail mix. The door had held surprisingly well, so we'd just make a break back to the creek and try to stick to familiar trails. It sounded simple on paper, terrifying in reality. With packs on our backs, we eased open the door. No sign of the creature. The clearing seemed almost peaceful in the morning light, and I felt a surge of false hope. We made it across to the tree lean without incident, and I started to believe we might just pull this off. That's when the ground trembled beneath us. A guttural growl echoed through the forest, and from between the trees, the creature emerged. It stalked towards us, head lowered, those yellow eyes focused with terrifying intent. Run! The man shouted, already sprinting back towards the cabin. I followed, fear pushing me faster than I thought I could go. The creature was closing the gap, though, those massive paws ripping through the undergrowth. I risked a glance back and saw its jaws were open, dripping with saliva. Panic squeezed my heart. I wasn't going to make it. Back at the clearing, the man had the cabin door open. I pushed myself harder, a desperate surge of energy carrying me those last few yards. I dove inside, hearing the creature's roar directly behind me as the door slammed shut. We both stood there, gasping for air. Then I looked at the man, really looked at him. He was covered in thin, wiry black fur, with the same elongated skull shape as the creature outside. You're one of them. I choked out, backing away. He didn't deny it. Yeah, he said wearily. One of them. But why? I couldn't form the question. He went to the window, looking out at the beast. They're territorial. Most folks don't get close enough to trigger it, but you did. He paused. I'm not like the rest, though. Got differences. 
So why help me? I knew I should be running, but my feet were frozen. He shrugged, a human gesture that looked strange on his inhuman form. I got my reasons. Right now, that thing wants you dead. Me? I can reason with it most times. I stared at him, struggling to process. A shapeshifter, maybe? A werewolf, like in some bad horror film? He didn't look like those, though. No silver bullet solutions here. Yet, crazy as it sounded, he'd saved my life twice now. It'll stay out there, waiting, he said. We're trapped till nightfall. The day dragged on. Every noise sent fresh terror coursing through me. The man, who wouldn't give his name, talked a bit more. Just snippets, about his life, his condition, how he mostly got by alone. The sun started to go down filling the cabin with shifting shadows. The creature outside hadn't made a sound in hours, but we both knew it was biding its time. The man stood by the door, hand on a rusty old axe propped in the corner. Listen, kid. His voice was low. Soon as that door opens, it's coming in. You gotta go out the window and run like hell. Don't look back. What about you? I knew the question was stupid, but I couldn't leave him to die. I'll hold it off as long as I can. He gave me a grim half-smile. Get yourself to town, all right? Tell him, tell him you saw a wild dog attack. Don't say nothing else. Before I could protest, he was at the door, bracing himself. I scrambled onto the sill of the back window panic and determination warring in my chest. He threw open the door. An ear-splitting roar filled the cabin as the creature charged inside. I heard the crash of the fight, the man's shouts, and then I jumped. The fall was short, and I hit the ground running, scrambling for the trees, the sounds of the struggle fading behind me. I ran until my lungs burned, until I thought I might collapse. When I finally stopped, I was miles away, deep in unfamiliar woods. It took another day to find my way to a path, another two to reach a ranger station. I told them my story, sanitized, as instructed. They searched, but never found any trace of the cabin, the man, or the creature. I got labeled, hiker traumatized by animal attack. They said it happens sometimes. Me? I know what I saw. I know what he did for me. And sometimes, at night, when I hear a sound a bit too much like a growl, I wonder if he survived. And I wonder if the creature they say I imagined is still out there, maybe in some other remote clearing, waiting for its next victim. I never really believed in Bigfoot stories. You grow up hearing them, but they're lumped in with campfire tales and UFO sightings. Fun to think about, not something you take seriously. Guess I should have paid more attention. Course, if I had, probably wouldn't be in this mess. My name's Easton, Easton Myers. Yeah, odd name, but that's the old man for you. This whole ordeal happened in 2001. I was fresh out of college, itching to see a bit more of the country before settling down somewhere. Decided on the Pacific Northwest. Heard the hiking was out of this world. Started out small, little trails around Mount Rainier National Park. Even caught a glimpse of the peak, which was cool. But something about those manicured paths wasn't doing it for me. I wanted to get off the beaten track. A few locals in one of those small trail towns, the kind with one blinking stoplight and too many souvenir shops, told me about an old lumber root up in the northern part of the park. Supposedly, it hadn't been used in decades, mostly reclaimed by the forest. 
Figured a bit of a challenge would be just the thing to get my blood pumping. Day one on that lumber route was rough. Overgrown, no sign of the path, at least not that I could see. More than once I thought about turning back, but stubbornness is my curse as much as my curiosity. Finally, as the sun was starting to dip, I stumbled onto something solid, a cracked asphalt road. Figured it had to be part of the old route. By then I was beat. Found a flat bit of ground nearby, just enough space to throw down my sleeping bag. I wolfed down some jerky, watched the stars come out, and figured I'd worry about the actual hiking in the morning when I had daylight. Woke up with that feeling you get sometimes. Like there's eyes on you. Open mind to see the biggest damn black bear I'd ever laid eyes on snuffling around my campsite. Froze solid, every instinct screaming at me to be tiny, to be no threat. Worked with squirrels, but this wasn't no park squirrel. The bear lifted its head, looked right at me, and let out a snort that rumbled through my chest. I'd heard they could be aggressive, especially if they smelled food, and maybe my jerky counted. Slowly, I reached for my backpack. Bear made that low rumbling growl. I eased out my canister of pepper spray, only defense I had. The bear must have liked the idea of easy food even less than a spicy face because with another snort, it turned and lumbered off into the trees. I breathed a sigh of relief, but it turned out luck wasn't on my side that day kept following that old road, and it led me straight into a whole different kind of trouble. It petered out at the edge of a ravine, way too steep and overgrown to try and climb down. Figuring it was a dead end, I was about to head back when I saw the cabin. The thing was old, wood-weathered gray, one of the windows broken. But next to it was a makeshift rack with freshly split firewood. Somebody had been there recently. That's when the first prickle of unease went down my spine. Why build a cabin way out here, and why keep it up if you weren't using it? I called out a stupid, Hello? Echoing in the still air. Nothing answered. Should have left then. Every sensible part of me was screaming to get back out to where I knew people were. Instead, curiosity, and maybe a dash of I gotta prove I can handle this pushed me forward. The cabin door creaked open when I pushed. Inside, it was dim, dusty, and way emptier than I expected. A fireplace, a wooden table, and one cot with a pile of furs stacked on it. Didn't even look like there'd ever been a stove or anything for cooking. Before I could puzzle over that too much— I heard a noise outside. Crunching footsteps, getting closer. Every bear encounter story I'd ever heard flashed through my head, followed by a spike of real panic. I scrambled to the broken window, peering out. What I saw, well, my brain still won't settle on it right. It walked like a man, but hunched over. Too tall to be fully human, and it moved too quick, too fluid and the fur, thick, coarse black that made my big bear look like a house cat. Then, it lifted its head, and I saw the glint of eyes and teeth. Way too long, way too sharp. In that split second, two things registered, that whatever this thing was, it was a predator, and it had seen me. I slammed back from the window, heart pounding. I had to think, had to have a plan— my pepper spray? Useless against anything that big. Then I remembered, under the cot, I'd seen what looked like a rifle. The creature slammed into the door, wood splintering. I fumbled for the rifle, hands shaking. Loaded? I hadn't checked, damn it. The door splintered again, a splintered piece tearing off and clattering across the floor. I yanked back the bolt on the rifle and aimed at the splintered opening, finger on the trigger. A massive paw, tipped with claws that could probably rip through me like paper, shoved through the splintered door. 
I fired, the gunshot booming in the enclosed space, the smell of cordite choking the air. The creature roared, a bone-shaking sound more animal than any human should make. The paw retreated from the doorway, and I took advantage of the pause to stumble backward, scrambling for the window. I smashed through it, barely feeling the sting of the broken glass. In my head I knew I should run, just put as much distance as possible between me and that cabin. But my legs wouldn't listen. I was frozen in place, staring as the creature emerged from the cabin, hunched form silhouetted against the afternoon sun. It walked slowly, each step deliberate, like it was savoring the moment before the kill. I saw the ragged wound on its shoulder where my shot had hit. Blood dripped down its black fur, but it didn't seem to be slowing down. Another roar filled the air, and it charged. I snapped out of my paralysis, turned, and ran. Trees blurred, branches whipped at my face. I could hear the creature pounding behind me, those claws tearing up the dirt with each step. Every instinct told me I was prey, that this was how it would end, some bloody heap on the forest floor. Ahead I saw it, the ravine. No way down, but to the left, the land leveled out towards a creek bed. It was a long shot, but I veered towards it, heart pounding a desperate rhythm in my ears. My feet hit the creek, slipping on the muddy bank. The creature roared directly behind me, so close the hairs on my neck stood on end. I dove forward, splashing into the water, the shock of the cold momentarily overwhelming the terror. I scrambled up the opposite bank, tearing through bushes and slipping on the wet rocks. Behind me, I heard a crash and a growl of frustration. The creature couldn't follow me through the creek. The ravine walls were too steep for its bulk. It was pacing back and forth along the other side now, snarling its rage. Didn't matter. I knew the second something shifted, that it found a climbable spot, I was dead. I ran, ignoring the burning in my lungs, the way branches tore at my arms. Finally, burst onto something familiar, the old asphalt road. I didn't slow, didn't look back. Just kept running until I saw the glint of metal through the trees, a parked truck. Salvation. I pounded on the door, barely able to get a coherent word out when the startled hunter inside rolled down the window. After that, it's a blur. The hunter got me back to the ranger station. I told them some tale about getting lost, that I startled a bear and it chased me for a bit. They looked at me like I was an idiot for hiking alone so far off trail, and maybe they were right. Never did tell them the real story. Nobody'd believe me, and honestly, some days I'm not sure I believe it myself. But I saw what I saw. The cabin, the paw, those yellow eyes, and that howl, God, I still hear it in my nightmares. It took me weeks to leave the area. Kept waiting on news of missing persons, attacks. Nothing came. Drove down to California, got a boring desk job, tried to convince myself that normal life was still possible after, after that. Sometimes I wonder if whatever that creature was, if it's still out there. If somewhere up in the tangled forests of Mount Rainier, something huge and hungry is hunting for its next meal. And sometimes, late at night when the city seems too quiet, I think I hear a distant roar, and wonder if maybe it remembers me too. Aftermath they never find any trace of a creature near Mount Rainier matching Easton's description, leaving authorities to conclude it was either a hallucination or a bear with some form of skin condition. Easton continues to struggle with nightmares of the incident, finding comfort only in avoiding solitary hikes and wooded areas as best he can. He keeps the rifle he found under the cot in a case under his bed claiming it's for home protection, but unable to bring himself to get rid of it. Some nights, 
He swears he still smells wood smoke and rotting meat on the breeze, but dismisses it as mere paranoia. He often sits by his window and looks out at the cityscape, wondering what other unseen things might be lurking out there in the vastness of the world. And as he drifts off to sleep, haunted by flashes of sharp teeth and burning yellow eyes, Easton thinks he might have been better off facing the creature in the forest than carrying the unseen beast of his memory for the rest of his days. It was supposed to be an escape, you know? I'm Waylon, Waylon Bates. Been working the oil rigs down in Texas for longer than I care to remember. Finally saved up enough for some real time off, decided to go way out of my comfort zone. Rented a beat-up old truck and headed up into Olympic National Forest in Washington State. Grew up in the desert, figured the complete opposite was due. 1988 it was. No fancy GPS trackers or cell phones for backup. Got myself a proper map, compass, all the gear I read about. I even had one of those emergency signal mirrors, case things went south. Always been smart, cautious about the outdoors. Funny how that turned out, huh? First few days were, unsettling is the word. I'm used to big, wide open space. Those forests up there, though? Trees so big they block the sun, everything damp and quiet. Sound doesn't travel like it should. Couple times I thought I heard someone, or something, behind me, but there was never anything when I turned. Nerves, probably. By day three, I was wishing I'd spent my money on a beach vacation. But I ain't the kind of guy to quit, so I pushed deeper, Figure I'd find that picture-perfect lake or something, make it all worthwhile. That's when I saw the old cabin. Seemed out of place, sitting all alone in the middle of all those trees. No trail nearby, just this clearing with the cabin dead center. Curiosity, that eternal curse of mine, got the better of me. Should have hightailed it right out of there, but no, I gotta go poking my nose in. Cabin was small, run down. Door was hanging off one hinge, and there was this weird, not a smell, but this feeling about the place. Like the air was heavier. Inside was empty except for a pile of old furs and a stone fireplace. I went out back, expecting an outhouse or something, but there was nothing. Whoever stayed there did their business in the woods, I guess. While I'm poking around, that heavy feeling in the air gets worse. My neck hairs prickle like a dog senses a storm. I get myself out of there, back on what passes for a trail nearby. Figured I'm done with this detour, might as well start heading back towards civilization. I haven't gone ten steps when I hear it, a growl, low and rumbling like nothing I've ever heard before. Spin around and there it is half hidden behind some brush. Figured it was a bear at first, big one. But as it stepped out of the shadow, it wasn't right. Too tall to be a bear, even standing on its hind legs. Fur was all wrong too, bristly, almost like coarse, black hair. And as it stepped into the light, I got a proper look at its head, snout too long, teeth like a wolf's but bigger, and those eyes pure yellow with a slitted pupil. I froze, mind blank with terror. Then instinct kicked in and I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. The creature didn't roar. It just made this sound. It wasn't a bark, but sharp and echoing. I could feel its breath hot on my neck as I tore through the undergrowth. Then something slammed into my side and I went down hard. I scrambled, half expecting another hit, but for a moment, there was just heavy panting and the rustle of leaves. Pain flared in my ribs, something wasn't right with my arm. I looked up and saw the creature circling me, 
studying me like I was some strange bug. It seemed, not confused, but maybe curious. Then the heavy feeling in the air got worse, almost pressing down on me, and I realized what was coming next. Survival mode kicked in again. That old rental truck was my only hope. I knew if I could reach the clearing, maybe I could get the door open, barricade myself. I didn't look back as I ran, branches whipping my face. I could hear the creature gaining on me, its footsteps sounding disturbingly human. I burst out of the trees and saw the truck, my heart leaping with desperate hope. But something was blocking the door. At first, I didn't even comprehend what I was seeing. A mass of dark fur bent over, something. Then I saw the blood, the tattered bits of cloth, my old flannel shirt, and it hit me. That hunter I passed on the road in a couple of days ago, the one I thought was just taking a break. The creature had him. Was feeding, tearing. I didn't wait to see the rest. Got that truck door open, fumbled for the keys, but my hands were shaking too hard. The creature dropped the, what was left, and turned toward me, a snarl pulling its lips back. The truck started with a roar that was almost a relief after the suffocating forest silence. I didn't bother trying to fasten my seatbelt, just slammed the thing in reverse and stomped on the gas. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I saw the creature lunge after me, but the truck jolted backward, throwing it off balance. I shifted into drive, swerving to avoid the trees I'd so desperately run towards minutes earlier. The rear window exploded inward, showering me with glass. A massive paw, tipped with ragged claws, reached inside, scrabbling for purchase. I swerved wildly, trying to dislodge it. The paw clawed at the edge of the busted window for a terrifying moment, and I saw a jagged piece of the mirror slice into its flesh. It roared not in pain, but in fury, and pulled back. I didn't wait to see if it would chase again. I floored the accelerator, the scenery blurring into a smeared tunnel of green and brown. Every creak, every rattle of the truck sounded like the creature was climbing back on. It felt like hours before I saw any sign of the main road. I blasted through the intersection, barely slowing, drawing startled honks from the few passing cars. Then it was just me in that open stretch of asphalt, and I pushed the truck as fast as it would go. It wasn't until I crossed the border from Washington into Oregon that I dared pull over and catch my breath. My arm was a mess, bloody and throbbing, probably broken. Tore a strip off my undershirt, tried to make a makeshift sling. It was then I realized my signal mirror was gone must have fallen out during the chaos. No way I could go to a hospital. Cops would ask about the hunter, about the cabin, and about whatever that thing was. Nobody'd believe me anyway. I ended up ditching the truck outside a small town, figuring it might get reported stolen and slow down anyone, or anything, that might be looking for me. Hitched a ride south with a long-haul trucker, Got lucky he wasn't the talkative type. Made up some lies about a hiking accident. Kept my arm hidden as best I could. Ended up hopping buses. Heading back to Texas a roundabout way so nobody'd be expecting my return. Never slept well after that. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that heavy air, those yellow eyes. Heard the snarl right behind my ear. Nightmares of teeth and claws plagued me for years. Tried drinking myself to oblivion, but that just made the dreams worse. Finally, decided I had to do something, had to make it mean something. Started training. First it was just basic fitness, then I got into survival stuff, weapons, all of it. Figured, if those things were out there, someone ought to be ready for him. I spend years wandering, odd jobs to keep me going, always looking over my shoulder. 
figured eventually my luck would run out, the creature would catch up to me, or something else like it. Never did find anything concrete about it. No old stories matching the description. No other survivors. Started to think, maybe it was a one of a kind, some freak of nature. Maybe I'd even killed it back there in the woods. That's the hope I clung to anyway, even when I knew, deep down, it wasn't true. These days, I run a little outdoors supply store in a backwoods corner of Montana. Sell gear, give advice to the tourists. Sometimes, I see folks heading off into the wilderness with that same wide-eyed excitement I used to have. A part of me wants to warn them, tell them there's things out there that maps won't protect you from. Still keep a rifle under the counter, shotgun in the back room, and a knife on me at all times. Got motion sensor cameras set up around my property, too. Just in case. Truth is, I don't know if I'll ever have peace. If there's more of those creatures out there, or, God forbid, if somewhere it left its offspring or something. I reckon my life took a strange turn back in that Washington forest. Maybe I died there with that hunter, and this is a kind of hell of my own making. But some mornings, when the sun's rising and the mountains are quiet, I think of that mirror glinting on the ground where it fell. I still think maybe that bought me some time. And hope, that sliver of stubbornness in the human spirit, keeps whispering that if I'm still breathing, then there's still a fight left in me. And if those yellow eyes ever do come out of the dark again, well, I'll be ready. The decision to take that shortcut was, in hindsight, the worst of my life. Name's Rhett, Rhett Ellison. And if you ever find yourself in the Smoky Mountains, and I hope you don't for reasons that'll be obvious soon, stick to the marked trails don't get cocky like I did. It was 2009. I'd always loved hiking, figured I was in good shape. A bit older than the spry young things tackling the Appalachian Trail, but I could hold my own and then some. I was taking a solo, week-long backpacking trip when the rain started. It wasn't a drizzle, but a full-on downpour. I wasn't far from a shelter, figured I'd hole up there for the night. Problem was, the trail that wound back and forth along a steep slope. With the rain, things were getting slick. That's when I saw the shortcut, an old deer path, barely visible through the trees, but it cut almost directly towards the shelter. Seemed like a no-brainer. I left the main trail, cursing as the underbrush and old roots snagged at my pack and legs. Pretty quick, I couldn't even see the trail anymore. But I kept going, stupid I know now, but back then? Well, let's just say I was determined. The rain started to ease as I went deeper into the forest. But things were getting wrong. The trees seemed too dense, the air too quiet. And something about the light was off, even under the thick canopy. I stopped to get my bearings, and my skin prickled. I thought I heard a noise behind me, a low, rasping sound that didn't belong in the woods chalked it up to nerves, started walking again. A few minutes later, I saw it. The shelter was just a bit further up the path. Relief flooded through me, but then, something slammed into my pack from behind, sending me sprawling on the muddy ground. I rolled, scrambled back to my feet, my heart pounding. My first thought was a bear, maybe a cub, and I'd blundered close to its mama. But what I saw as I turned, it didn't fit. The creature was huge, easily seven feet tall, even hunched over. At first, I couldn't make it out, the rain and dim light blurring its form. But as it stepped closer, the details chilled me to the bone. Yellow eyes, shining even in the gloom, set in a skull-like face that was too long, too angular. Its fur was patchy, 
some places bare, others matted in clumps, revealing mottled skin the color of spoiled meat. I froze, unable to process what I was seeing. It studied me, intelligently, it seemed, then opened its mouth. The teeth, too many teeth, jagged and uneven in rows extending further back than should be possible. My brain short-circuited, and I did the only thing I could, I bolted. Didn't look behind me, just ran. Roots snagged my feet, branches slapped me blind. Sound was muffled by the rain, couldn't tell if it was chasing me. Terror fueled my every step. I burst from the trees and onto a gravel road. Across it, I could see the welcome sight of the shelter and safety. It was so close, but... Something erupted from the forest behind me with a deafening roar, the creature. It landed on the gravel road with inhuman speed, its eyes fixed on me. I ran for the shelter, but my rain-soaked boots slipped. I crashed down hard, my ankle exploding in pain. Fear was an icy fist in my gut as I dragged myself forward, the shelter agonizingly close. The creature stalked towards me, its movements unsettling. Too jerky to be a four-legged animal, but not quite human. I sobbed, the pathetic sound lost in the downpour. I was reaching for the shelter posts when a heavy boot slammed down beside my outstretched hand. I flinched, expecting the teeth, the claws, but I looked up to see a stranger. Tall, rugged-looking guy with a shotgun leveled at the creature. I'd never seen a more beautiful sight than that beat-up, old gun. Get up and get inside, the stranger barked, and I somehow managed to scramble to my feet. Inside the shelter, I collapsed, my body finally accepting the trembling I'd been fighting for so long. The guy didn't relax, but stood watch outside, the rain plastering his graying hair to his head. The creature paced back and forth along the tree line, growling and clawing at the earth. It was just beyond the range of the porch light, an eerily shaped shadow of fury. What? I choked out, my voice raw. What is that thing? The man spared a glance my way. You tell me, he said grimly. But for now, stay down and let's hope whatever it is ain't got back up. Hours passed, the creature in unsettling presence just beyond the light. Turns out, the stranger's name was Harlan. Ex-military, he said, and from his demeanor, I believed him. We took turns keeping watch napping in short bursts when the other was on guard. I tried to tend to my ankle, but it was badly twisted, maybe broken. Harlan made an improvised splint from some fallen branches, which helped, but the pain was intense. By sunrise, the creature was gone. We exited the shelter cautiously, weapons ready even though the gnawing fear told me it was lurking nearby. Harlan helped me hobble back towards the road, a slow and grueling trek that took most of the morning. I finally worked up the courage to ask again about the creature. Harlan hesitated, then said, These mountains got their own secrets. Some things just ain't meant to be understood. It was the closest we got to an answer. We finally reached the main trail, a wave of relief washing over me when we saw other hikers. Harlan got me to a ranger station, where they called for help. Explaining the whole thing was interesting. Some folks thought bear attack, but a few exchanged knowing glances like they weren't entirely convinced. Harlan vanished before I could thank him properly, just leaving a note saying he had other places to be. Official record ended up listing it as an animal encounter, but I knew... Everyone who saw my face knew that was a lie. I spent weeks in physical therapy. The ankle never fully healed. Sometimes, if I'm walking alone and it's getting dark, I catch a whiff of wet fur and rotting meat, and every muscle locks up. Never went back to the Smokies. I hike, sure, 
but I stick to crowded parks, well-traveled paths. Maybe it was PTSD. Maybe I really had stumbled onto something that most people never glimpse. I spent some nights down a few rabbit holes trying to find any local legend, any whisper that matched what I'd seen. Nothing that fit quite right, but lots of stories about things lurking in the deep woods. Then, a few years back, I overheard some guys at a bar talking about some old-timer they knew, a hunter up in those same mountains. Said he claimed to have seen some, creature, thing that haunted these secret paths, hunting those foolish enough to leave the trail. They were laughing, calling it campfire tall tales, but something about their description hit me. When they showed me a picture of the old hunter, it was Harlan. I never went up to them, didn't introduce myself. Some part of me didn't want confirmation, wanted to leave a sliver of doubt. But there's another part, the part that still sees those gleaming eyes and nightmares, that knows the truth. Present day, Rhett lives an isolated life. While he still ventures out on hikes, they're confined to well-maintained trails and national parks and always in the company of others. The psychological scars are harder to mend than the physical ones, and he occasionally gets help from a therapist who specializes in unusual trauma. He hasn't given up his search for information entirely, but it's more about finding a sense of community than any expectation of concrete answers. Most days, he manages to convince himself it was some weird, deformed animal, a horrific anomaly. Yet some nights... When the wind howls with just the right pitch, he stares out his window into the darkness and wonders if his creature is out there, still hunting. And if, perhaps, he wasn't the only one to stumble across its path, but merely one of the few who escaped long enough to tell the tale. The ones still out there, lost on overgrown trails, aren't so lucky, their bones joining the countless others that have vanished into those ancient untamed woods. And for all he knows, the old mountain man, Harlan, was one of them. Sometimes he thinks about trying to warn people. He's even drafted posts for hiking forums, trying to find words that convey the horror without making him sound insane. He always deletes them in the end. Who would believe him anyway? Instead, he keeps to himself tries to enjoy the smaller beauties of life, while always, always staying on the path. You know those stories about folks going missing in national parks? Yeah, always used to figure they were bad luck or bad choices. Turns out, Sometimes there's a way worse answer. My name's Wyatt, and this whole mess happened back in 2012 when I was fresh out of college. Been a hiker since I could walk, so I thought, hell, let's explore some lesser-known trails before real life starts. Ended up in Sequoia National Forest in California. Stunning place, but the kind where you get real isolated real fast. First couple of days went fine. I plotted a route away from the main tourist drags to really get a feel for the place. Day three, the solitude started feeling less peaceful, more oppressive. The air felt heavier, and I kept getting this prickling feeling on the back of my neck, like I was being watched. Shook it off, nerves, probably. Then, that night... I woke up to a scratching sound right outside my tent. My heart pounded, but I figured it was just a raccoon or something nosing around for food. I banged on the side of the tent, yelled to scare it off. Silence, then I heard it moving, not scampering away like a small animal, but something big circling the tent. The scratching started again, louder this time, and I froze. There was a... Wrongness to the sound. Too sharp, too deliberate. With trembling hands, I unzipped the tent just a crack. Outside, in the faint moonlight, stood 
the thing. At first, my brain wouldn't process the image. Too tall, even hunched over. Its skin, it didn't look like fur. More like gray scales, patchy in places. And I swear there was something glistening underneath, like it was wet. Then there were the eyes, huge, bright green in the darkness. And the teeth, way too many, crammed in a snout that jutted out unnaturally from its skull. Terror was a cold knot in my gut. It studied my tent, its head tilting in that inhuman, jerky way birds have. Every instinct screamed to run, but it was right there. I held my breath, praying if I didn't move it wouldn't see me as anything more than an oddly shaped rock. Finally, it moved off, and I heard a loud crack in the undergrowth. I realized the scratching had been its claws on the hard earth. I stayed huddled in that tent all night, every creak of a branch sounding like its monstrous footsteps returning. First light came as a near-miraculous relief, but I wasn't dumb enough to just pack up and go. I kept low, watching my surroundings like my life depended on it, which, let's be real, it probably did. I saw movement a couple of times out of the corner of my eye, but nothing as clear as the night before. Then, just before sundown, I spotted it again. It was just across the clearing I'd set up camp in. Crouching by a stream, scooping water up in long, bony hands and lapping at it like an animal. It was so focused on drinking, I almost felt a pang of pity, that is, until it lifted its head, and I saw the mangled deer carcass next to it. My stomach lurched. Suddenly, I wasn't just prey. I was competition. And whatever this creature was, it wasn't something I could fight or outrun. One thought remained clear through the blind panic. I had to get out. Leaving my tent and most of my supplies behind, I took off. I wasn't familiar enough with the area to know if I was even headed in the right direction, just had to put distance between myself and that clearing. Branches whipped my face, but I didn't dare slow down. The sun was dipping below the horizon when I stumbled across it, a ranger's cabin, tucked deep in the trees. It looked abandoned, dusty and dark, but that didn't matter. If there was a door that locked, that was better than facing the night out there with that thing. The door squealed open. Inside was sparse, like nobody had stayed there in years. I searched frantically until I found a bolt-action rifle in a closet under a pile of musty blankets. Didn't know how to use it, but figured it was better than nothing. I settled in, barricading the door with an old dresser and trying to calm my ragged breathing. Through the window, the last of the light faded, and the woods fell into an unnatural silence. That's when I heard the snuffling. Soft at first, then growing louder, closer. It was circling the cabin, just like it had circled my tent. I clutched the rifle, knowing it was a flimsy shield at best. The snuffling stopped, and I heard a horrifying new sound, claws scraping deliberately against the wood. In a moment of desperation, I fumbled for my lighter. What happened next? I can only describe as pure animal instinct. I flung open the window, flicked the lighter, and hurled it straight into the waiting darkness. A guttural roar pierced the night as the lighter landed just beyond the window. Flames bloomed, catching on the dry needles littering the ground, followed immediately by a shriek of pain and fury. In the flickering light, I finally got a proper look at the creature. Its scaled hide glistened wetly, and now I could see the patches of glistening underneath weren't moisture. They were raw, exposed flesh, some losing a greening fluid. The fire had caught its fur in places too, revealing the mottled, diseased skin beneath. Those green eyes blazed with pain-fueled rage. For one heart-stopping moment, it thrashed in the flames, a horrific tableau of fire and fury. 
Then it turned and bolted back into the darkness with a speed I hadn't thought possible, leaving behind the smell of burnt flesh and something acrid that turned my stomach. I slumped against the wall, rifle forgotten. Had I actually heard it? Had I driven it off, or just enraged it further? I had no way of knowing. Fear and exhaustion warred inside me. I dragged myself to my feet, forcing myself to assess the situation. Fire was a weapon, seemed like. But the woods were tinder dry, and any blaze I set could quickly grow out of hand. Plus, I had no clue where the creature had gone, and if it circled around. No, sitting and waiting wasn't an option. That first night, it had bided its time, observed. It wasn't going to make the same mistake twice. The fire was still smoldering outside. It wasn't much, but it was light, and I was desperate. I grabbed the rifle, a few supplies, and tore a strip from a blanket. Soaking it in the last of my water, I fashioned a crude torch. The forest was a nightmare. Every shadow flickered monstrously, the scent of smoke turning every rustle into approaching claws. But with my makeshift torch held high, I stumbled forward, driven by the primal knowledge that standing still was a worse death sentence. Hours passed in a blur of adrenaline and terror. Somehow, amidst the heart-pounding dread, my mind gained a jagged sort of clarity. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't natural. The disease, the strange mix of animal, and, not, something was wrong with it on a level deeper than just a predator. At daybreak, I found a road, not the main highway, but a gravel tool lane. I collapsed on the edge, too numb for relief. Turns out, being lost in the woods will get a search crew out mighty quick, especially if you stumble out looking half-crazed and smelling like a wildfire. Got the full meal deal, paramedics checking me over, rangers asking a million questions, even a stern-faced sheriff looking unconvinced by my babbled story. After the initial ordeal, things blurred together. I remember snippets, blurry hospital rooms, the burning phantom smell of that creature, nightmares when I managed to sleep. Turns out, while I'd been scrambling through the woods, a small wildfire had started near the clearing where I'd first seen the creature. Some folks assumed I'd lost it and started the blaze myself. Others whispered about drugs, mountain madness. Nobody believed the truth. Neither did I some days. The worst part was, they never found anything out there, no body of a monstrous animal, no traces that didn't make sense. Officially, it was ruled a bear attack, maybe a rabid animal, though they couldn't explain the burns they insisted must have been self-inflicted. The aftermath is the part no story ever tells you about. The part that goes on and on. I never finished college, too spooked to go back couldn't stay indoors for long. I wander a lot, working odd jobs. Ranchers out west don't ask many questions if you're good with a horse and a gun. At night, under those wide-open skies, it almost feels safe, less chance of anything sneaking up in the dark. I see stories sometimes about people gone missing in those same woods. Hikers never found sometimes a shredded campsite or a pile of bones with tooth marks that don't match anything known. Folks chalk it up to bears, cougars gone too bold. But I know what's out there. I've seen it. And sometimes I think the creature remembers me too, the one that got away, the one that lit the fire. Every flicker of shadow in the corner of my eye, every snap of a twig is a reminder. They call it PTSD, survivor's guilt. They're right, in a way. I survived, but out there in those deep, ancient woods, the other part of the story is still unfolding. The forest holds its secrets tight, and something tells me they haven't forgotten the scent of smoke and burning flesh. 
Maybe someday they'll come looking for me. Until then, all I can do is keep moving, keep a low profile, and pray to whatever gods might still be listening that the fire I started was enough to keep it, or others like it, at bay. Always thought I was smart about the outdoors. Names Everett, Everett Gaines. Hiked since I was a kid, did some serious climbs in my younger days. Never the type to panic, always got backup plans. But what happened up in those mountains? Well, let's just say even the best planning won't save you when the wilderness itself turns against you. It was 1991 and I was itching to explore a remote trail in Olympic National Park. Not the popular stuff, but an old logging route, barely used anymore. Figured I'd have the solitude I craved. First couple days were pure heaven. Lush old-growth rainforest, silence so thick you could almost touch it. But on day three, things started to shift. It wasn't obvious at first. Just the feeling of being watched, the air getting heavier somehow. Then the wildlife started going nuts. Not scared off, but agitated. Birds screeching in crazy patterns, squirrels chittering nonstop. My instincts were screaming, but I chalked it up to nerves. Until that night. Woke from a dead sleep to an earth-shaking howl. Like a wolf, but deeper, and something about the cadence wrong. Then it came again, closer, and a second joined in, a horrifying duet echoing through the valley. I lay frozen, a cold sweat starting despite the sleeping bag. Whatever those things were, they weren't natural. Dawn couldn't come fast enough. Broke camp in record time, heart thrumming a panicked rhythm. But my plan rooted back. It was wrong. Trees weren't where I remembered them, the undergrowth thicker, blocking paths that should have been open. Every time I thought I'd regained my bearings, it'd shift again, subtly but definitely. By afternoon, I was forced to admit the truth. I was lost. Not just misplaced, but well and truly turned around in a forest that seemed to be twisting itself in defiance of all logic. Panic threatened to bubble up, but I fought it back. Got to my high ground, trying to pick out landmarks, anything to get a fix. That's when I saw it. Across the ridge, a figure moving through the trees. Too tall to be human, bulky, its form weirdly misshapen. It saw me too, paused, head tilting bird-like. Hope flared, help even if it was some crazy recluse out this far. But then it turned, loping into the undergrowth with impossible speed, moving in that jerky, inhuman way that set off every alarm bell I had. Knew then that whatever was out there, it didn't want to be found. And now, I was being hunted. No more careful trekking, I ran. Heart pounded in my throat, branches slapped at my face. The forest seemed to fight back, roots tripping me, thorns tearing at my skin. The howls got closer, echoing around me now, a horrifying chorus. Stumbled onto another logging road, abandoned but blissfully wide open. I followed it, gasping for breath. Every time I looked back, I caught glimpses of movement just at the edge of the trees, dark shapes flitting like monstrous shadows. By some miracle, the road led me to a ranger station just as the sun dipped below the tree lane. Burst through the door, babbling my story to the startled ranger inside. I was a sight, I know, torn up, bleeding eyes wild. He got me calmed down a little, gave me water called for backup. That's when the other ranger came in, face pale. Said some hikers had found a campsite a few miles back. Shredded tent, gear scattered, blood splatters, and a set of footprints no animal they knew of could have made. That night, 
huddled by a crackling fire with armed rangers pacing outside, the howls started again. Distant, but I knew, with a bone-deep certainty, they were celebrating. The rangers couldn't hear them, dismissed it as coyotes, but I knew better. The forest had marked me, claimed me as prey, and it wasn't done yet. Search teams combed those woods, found nothing. No bodies, human or otherwise. That mangled campsite was the last trace of anything wrong. Officially, those folks were declared missing, likely victims of an animal attack. But those of us who were there, we know what we heard. It's been years now. I hike local trails, always with a group, but I'll never head into the deep woods alone again. Can't shake the feeling that on starless nights, with the wind in the trees a certain way, those howls might echo in my nightmares. And if I ever catch a shifting glimpse of something just beyond the light, a monstrous shape with eyes that burn like hunger. Name's Malachi, Malachi Jones. Used to be a park ranger out in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful place. Or it was, before it all went wrong. This happened back in 2007. Been a hiker all my life. Know those mountains like the back of my hand. Which is probably the only reason I'm still here to tell the tale. It was a routine patrol checking some backcountry trails less used by the tourists. First day, nothing out of the ordinary, some bare scat, the usual glimpses of deer. That evening, though, things started to feel off. That oppressive silence you get before a storm, but heavier somehow. Then I heard it, a rustling from the underbrush, too loud for a small animal dismissed it as my nerves getting the better of me. Next morning, I shouldered my pack and headed back out. That's when I saw the first dead elk. Hadn't been there the day before. Torn open, not in a way any predator I knew would do. Unease settled in my gut. Bears and mountain lions are messy. But this, this was methodical, almost surgical. The gnawing feeling that something was watching me intensified with every step. That afternoon, I reached an old hunter's cabin. Figured I'd hole up there for the night, use the radio to report the elk carcass when I got back to the station. I was checking the windows, making sure they were secure, when the screaming started. Came out of the woods, a blood-curdling howl that seemed to pierce my very soul. Not an animal I recognized, and I've heard my share of wolves and coyotes. This was wrong. Primal terror seized me, but something else too, a sense of recognition. Like whatever was out there, it knew me, was calling to me. Then, another howl answered the first, closer this time. My heart pounded so hard I thought it had burst. Whatever those things were, they were circling me. I grabbed my rifle, even though deep down, I knew it likely wouldn't do a damn thing. The night became a symphony of terror, the howls ringing through the darkness, sometimes close, sometimes further off, like they were toying with me. I huddled inside, rifle clutched in sweaty hands, sleep banished by the horrifying certainty that if I dared to drift off, I'd wake up with those glowing eyes staring in at me. By dawn, the howls had faded, but I wasn't dumb enough to think they were gone. I grabbed my gear, abandoned any pretense of sticking to the trail, and just started moving. Had to get back to the main road, get to help. Didn't take long for my flight to turn into a panic scramble. Kept catching glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye monstrous shapes half hidden by the trees. They were shepherding me, pushing me in a certain direction. Every instinct told me to break away, to fight, but fear froze my feet. Then I saw it, up ahead, a clearing I didn't recall being there before. And in the center of that clearing, 
my worst fears made manifest. A creature, easily eight feet tall, stood on two legs like a man, but the body, it was an impossible mix of fur scales and something like raw, weeping flesh. And the head, God's the head. Antlers jutted from a skull that was too long, filled with rows of needle-like teeth. Its eyes, burning with a chilling intelligence, locked on mine. I screamed, a wordless cry of pure terror, and finally my legs obeyed. I ran, stumbling blindly, the forest blurring around me. The creature didn't immediately pursue, but the sound of its footsteps lumbering behind me, unhurried and confident, spurred me on like a whip. For what felt like hours I ran, pushed my body to its absolute limit. Lungs burned, muscles screamed in protest, but I didn't slow. And slowly, the sounds of pursuit faded. Then I tripped, falling hard, rolled to my knees, gasping for breath, and saw the trees giving way up ahead to the ranger station. A flicker of hope ignited in me. I scrambled the last few yards, burst through the station door, and slammed it behind me. Half collapsed against the wall, unable to speak for the ragged gasps tearing from my lungs. Took me several minutes, slumped on the rough-hewn floorboards, to get enough breath to string a coherent sentence together told the startled rangers what I'd seen, trying to downplay the most outlandish parts. They exchanged worried glances, and that's when the other ranger, Jonas, walked in. He held something in his hand, a gruesome trophy, a severed elk leg, the flesh torn in that same disturbingly precise way. News of the sightings, both mine and the elk's mutilated corpse, spread fast. A larger search team was sent in, armed to the teeth. But they found nothing. No tracks, no trace of anything except ordinary wildlife. Officially, it was chalked up to a rogue bear in its death throes, likely long gone from the area. Those who were out there with me, though, we knew the truth. The aftermath is the part you never hear about, the part that sticks with you worse than any snarling monster. Started with the nightmares, not just the creature, but the feeling of the forest itself turning against me, twisting and tangling to trap me at its mercy. The other rangers, they tried to be supportive, but I saw the doubt in their eyes. They whispered behind my back, mountain madness, they called it, said the isolation got to me. After a while, it started to feel like I was the hunted one even back in the relative safety of headquarters. Left the park service not long after. It wasn't the fear, at least not exactly. It was more, I couldn't stand the looks, the unspoken accusations. I knew what I saw. That thing was real, and whatever it was, it had marked me, branded me with its malevolent attention. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine I can still hear its echoing howls on the wind. Moved across the country to a place as far from mountains and forests as I could get. Work construction, stay indoors as much as possible, keep my head down. Never been the type to believe in all those old stories. Those tales about things lurking just beyond the campfire light. But after what I saw... I'm not quite so quick to dismiss the impossible anymore. Sometimes, in those restless nights, I imagine those burning eyes in the darkness beyond my window and wonder what it's like up there in those mountains now. Do those rangers who replaced me find more torn-up carcasses? Do other hikers vanish amidst whispers of bears gone rogue? Or has the creature gone dormant, content to wait until some other unwitting soul stumbles across its path. I still hike, gotta keep in shape somehow, but it's city parks for me these days, manicured paths where the biggest dangers unleash dogs. Yet every time I see a line of trees at the edge of my vision, a prickle of unease crawls down my spine. Sometimes I think it would have been easier to have just died out there on that forest floor 
to have it all end at the claws of the monster. Instead, I keep living this half-life, forever haunted, knowing the wilderness, the real wilderness, holds secrets that most men never encounter and fewer still survive. Sometimes I hear folks talk about those old mountain legends, about the Wendigo, the Skinwalkers, all those names whispered around campfires meant to send a thrill of fear down your spine. Now, I know those tales might hold a darker kernel of truth than anyone suspects. They say that once you've stared into the abyss, it stares back. The mountains stared back at me that day, and their gaze twisted something deep within the forest, and within me. I'll never forget that clearing, or the impossible creature that waited for me there. That primal part of me, a part one never knew existed recognizes it in the shadows, lurking just past the reach of the streetlights. I suppose, in a way, it is what I am now, a survivor of the unthinkable, a man forever changed by an encounter with the wilderness few could even imagine, let alone believe. And even here in the heart of this concrete jungle, sometimes when the night is still, I think I hear a distant howl echoing in the spaces between the buildings a horrifying reminder that my ordeal is far from over. You know those old stories about Bigfoot sightings round these parts. Folks like to laugh him off, say it's all moonshine and tall tales. Well, let me tell you, Sometimes those stories hold a kernel of truth, a darkness most folks ain't prepared to face. My name's Harlan, Harlan Woodson. I'm a hunter born and bred in these Tennessee mountains, no one like my own calloused hands. This mess all happened back in 1998 during deer season. Opening day found me deep in a part of the Smokies most folks shun. Rumors about something monstrous lurking in those woods been passed down for generations. Personally, always figured it was tall tales, until that day. Had a good spot picked out, perched on a ridge with a clear line of sight across a thick ravine. Sun was starting to break through the mist when I heard a noise that sent a prickle down my spine. Not a deer, too heavy, too clumsy. Then I got a whiff of it like a wet dog that had rolled in something worse than dead. Kept low, rifle ready as the crashing through the underbrush grew louder, closer. That's when I saw it step into the clearing. Never laid eyes on anything like it, before or since, and I pray to God I never do again. It stood at least nine feet tall, hunched over, with thick, matted fur that looked more like rotting moss. The face, gods, the face was like something from a nightmare. Eyes too close together, gleaming yellow, and a snout that jutted out unnaturally, filled with wicked-looking teeth. My finger tightened on the trigger, some primal instinct screaming at me to run. But I froze, couldn't look away from those eyes filled with a chilling hunger. Then it let out a roar that shook the trees, like a bear mixed with something unholy. Finally, Hunter's sense kicked in, and I raised the rifle. Just then, I heard a voice behind me. Don't shoot it! Whirled around, nearly losing my footing, to see a grizzled old man I'd never laid eyes on before step out of the shadows. That ain't no creature God put on this earth, he said, his eyes fixed on the beast below. It had gone still, had tilted like it was listening. Then what in hell is it? I whispered, heart thrumming a terrified tattoo in my chest. Something old, something best left alone. Come with me, the old man said, stepping back into the trees. He seemed to know these woods in a way I never would, moving with uncanny silence. With a backward glance at the horrifying creature, I followed. We didn't stop till we reached a tiny, hidden lean-to tucked amidst the rocks. Inside, the old man lit a kerosene lamp, his gnarled hand steady. 
seemed to be waiting for me to speak, so I did. That thing, what was it? The firelight flickered across his weathered face. There's names for such creatures, handed down long as folks been in these mountains. Some call em hide-behinds. I'd heard that name before, chilling tales told low around campfires. Always dismissed them as folklore, but the creature I'd seen, it fit the descriptions. They ain't like regular animals, he continued, his voice low. They got an intelligence most folks don't credit, a wickedness too deep for words. That explained the look in its eyes, the feeling like I was being weighed, measured. The rest of the day passed in a blur. The old man, he called himself Ezekiel, told bits and pieces of things that shook my understanding of the world to the core. He spoke of these creatures stalking the woods since time out of mind, praying not just on deer, but on unwary men lost or foolish enough to stray from the known paths. Then he said the thing that stuck with me all these years. That one, it saw you today, and it'll remember. Chills went down my spine even harder than when I'd first laid eyes on the creature. He led me back towards the main trails just as the sky was bleeding gold and red with sunset. I never set foot in those deep woods again, and I kept my mouth shut about what I saw. Folks laughed when I quit deer hunting altogether, called me cowardly. Let em think what they want. I know the truth. Ezekiel was right. It remembered me. Sometimes, late at night when the wind whistles through the cracks in my cabin, I swear I feel those eyes on me, hot and hungry in the darkness beyond my window. And I wonder if it's only waiting, biding its time till I make one false move. I always thought I was smart about backpacking. Name's Wyatt, Wyatt James. Been exploring trails since I was old enough to lace my own boots. This whole mess started in 2008. Got the itch to do an overnight on a remote, less-traveled loop in the North Cascades. Place is stunning, all jagged peaks and glaciers, but a bit lonely. First day went smooth. Perfect weather, made good time, maybe too good. Figured I'd push a bit further, beat the sunset to a campsite that showed on the topo map. That's when things started going, off. Trail got fainter, harder to follow, like it hadn't been used in years. By late afternoon, it was obvious I'd gotten myself well and truly turned around. Tried backtracking but the way I'd come seemed to twist and shift. Sun was starting to dip, and that's when I heard it, the sound of something big moving through the trees up ahead. My heart sank. Bare country, and I was alone and off the marked trails, like an idiot. Kept moving, trying to get to higher ground before dark, but the noises continued. Not the snuffling of a bear, these were wrong. Snapping branches, heavy footfalls, something that occasionally shifted onto two legs. Every instinct in me screamed to get out of those trees, but where the hell was I gonna go? It was closing in, getting bolder. Then, just as the last light was draining from the sky, I broke through the trees and into a clearing. And there it was. At least seven feet tall, covered in shaggy black fur, it moved with unnatural speed and grace for something its size. The face was the worst part, human enough to be uncanny, twisted into this permanent, grotesque grin, and its eyes, pure, predatory yellow. I froze, all my survival training vanishing, replaced by that bone-deep terror animal's sense in a predator. It tilted its head, studying me with that unnerving intelligence. Then two more of them stepped out of the woods, flanking the first. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I wasn't being hunted. I was being cornered. 
That's when the first one threw its head back and let loose a shriek that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It echoed off the mountains, a wild, inhuman sound. Suddenly, I wasn't the biggest, baddest thing in those woods. Every bit of me told me to run, but some flicker of defiance, or maybe sheer stupidity, kept me rooted in place. I wasn't going down without a fight. Drew the hunting knife on my belt, which probably looked like a toothpick compared to them. The creatures were closing in. Their grins seemed to grow wider, like they were enjoying this. That's when I saw the backpacker. A woman, stumbling out of the trees on the opposite side of the clearing, looking dazed and disoriented. My blood ran cold. Suddenly, I wasn't just prey, I was bait. She didn't see them at first, the creatures staying perfectly still, just those damned yellow eyes gleaming in the growing darkness. I yelled voice hoarse with desperation. Hey! Run! She whirled, eyes widening. And in that split second, when the creatures should have charged, they didn't. Just those grins getting even wider. I charged then, knife held high, not even sure what I was going to do, but I couldn't let her be taken. The creatures scattered with surprising agility, but I wasn't after them. Grabbed the woman's arm, dragged her back into the trees as the ear-splitting shrieks erupted behind us. Didn't stop running until my lungs were on fire. We burst from the tree lean hours later, miles from the clearing, blinking up at a sky full of stars. Managed to find the trail by dawn, and stumbled back to civilization looking like we'd been through a war zone. Of course, no one believed us. Park rangers brushed us off, said it was likely sleep deprivation and an overactive imagination. But there were things they couldn't explain. The shredded campsite where I thought I was headed that doesn't exist on any map. The footprints they did find, which belonged to no known animal. And the disappearances. Every few years, another lone hiker vanishes in that area without a trace. It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the Adirondack High Peaks. You know... I'd spent a lot of time hiking as a kid, so when I got out of the military, it was one of the first things I picked back up. Something about the solitude, the sense of accomplishment, it appealed to me. Most of my buddies thought I was nuts, going out into the wilderness alone, but I never gave it much thought. My name's Kellen, Kellen Brophy. This particular summer, I decided to tackle Marcy highest peak in New York. Beautiful country up there. I spent a few days driving, finally arriving at the Adirondack Lodge around noon on a Sunday. I signed the register, always better to make sure someone knows where you're going, grabbed a bite, and headed up the Van Hovenberg Trail. Now, Marcy itself is no joke. I'd done the research, knew the mileage, the elevation gain, Still, there's something about being on the ground that changes the calculations. The trail was rougher than I expected, whether a touch warmer. But I was fit, experienced, figured I'd make camp near Indian Falls, summit the next morning, then head back down. First four hours went by without a hitch. I reached Indian Falls right at dusk, and the view was breathtaking. The way the last sunlight hit the water, the mist rising up, it's the closest I ever felt to being in a postcard. Found a flat spot just off the trail, pitched my tent with enough light left to rustle up some dinner. Nothing fancy, a dehydrated meal and an apple. It's always funny, the sounds of the forest at night. I grew up rural, but being out alone, it's different. Every rustle, Every snap of a twig had my head whipping around. 
I joked to myself about how many bear attacks probably didn't happen due to overactive imaginations of hikers. Still, better safe than sorry, so I packed the remaining food in a bear canister and hung it well away from camp. Sleep was restless. Too much excitement about the final climb, I suppose. Woke near dawn, feeling that odd premonition you sometimes get. Can't explain it, just a sense that something was off. I shrugged it off, broke down the tent, and started the trek upwards. Now this was the tough part, steeper, rockier, the forest closing in around me. About an hour in, I got that prickly feeling on the back of my neck. You know the one. Like you're being watched. I spun around, heart pounding, but saw nothing. Took a breath, told myself I was just getting spooked. Ten minutes later, it happened again. This time I didn't even try to reason it away. Something was back there. The next hour was a blur of nervous glances over my shoulder, every sound making me jumpy. Finally, near Phelps, I stopped, setting my pack down hard. All right, whoever's playing games, it's not funny. Come on out. Silence. I waited a beat, then raised my voice. Look, I don't know if you're lost or messing around, but I've got a long hike ahead. How about we call a truce? Nothing. I considered my options for a moment. Turning back wasn't on the table, not at this point. But staying on edge wasn't sustainable either. I picked up a good-sized rock and yelled into the trees. Last warning! Show yourself or I'm coming in there. I chucked the rock as hard as I could. It clattered into the dense foliage, echoed back to me in the empty quiet. I hoisted my pack and continued forward. By the time I hit treeline, I was drenched in sweat, more from nerves than exertion. I kept thinking I heard footsteps behind me, faint, just on the edge of perception. Twice I stumbled as if something had tripped me, but no branches were in sight. The air itself felt thick, oppressive, like walking into a wall. The closer I got to the summit, the worse it became. My lungs burned, but that was only part of it. A sense of pure dread settled in my bones. I pushed on, half out of stubbornness, half out of a creeping certainty that turning back wouldn't help at this point. When I finally broke free of the trees and onto the exposed rock of the summit, my relief lasted all of three seconds. There, crouched near the survey marker, was the source of my unease. I can't say exactly what it was. Humanoid, yes, but wrong. Taller than any man I'd seen, impossibly thin. Skin pale like it never saw the sun and stretched tight over bone. Eyes black, enormous. It wore what looked like rags, dark and stained. The worst part, it saw me. It rose, tilting its head with that jerky motion animals have. No expression crossed its face. No aggression, as such. Just an intense, unblinking focus. I froze. Adrenaline kicked in, but in a direction I hadn't prepared for. All that military training, all those survival instincts, and I just stood there, gaping. Some primal part of my brain whispered run, but my limbs wouldn't respond. It took a step towards me. That broke the spell. I started backing away, still keeping my eyes locked on the creature. My heel caught on a rock, and I went down sprawling. It didn't pounce. Instead... It watched me scramble to my feet, watched me stumble across the summit, watched me disappear back into the trees. The terror didn't fade. I ran blindly, branches ripping at me, thorns tearing at my skin. No idea if it was giving chase, but I didn't look back. Stumbled out of the woods at the lodge, practically hysterical. Managed to choke out a few words to the shocked folks there 
something about the mountain, something following me. They called the rangers. By the time the search party went up, I'd calmed down enough to regret opening my mouth. I could see it in their eyes. They thought I was a loon. Maybe I was. They found no trace of anyone else up there, no footprints but mine. I swore I wasn't lying, wasn't hallucinating. But what proof did I have? Took me weeks to work up the courage to go hiking again. A year before I even considered a mountain. Even now, sometimes, I get that prickling feeling on my neck, that sense of something just out of sight. And I wonder, did I draw it to me that day, with my fear? Or was it always there, always watching, and I just finally noticed? The Pacific Crest Trail in 1991, that's where it all began. I was 24 back then, fresh out of college, itching to see something beyond dorm rooms and lecture halls. My name's Elroy, Elroy Finch. Folks thought it was an odd pairing, an old-fashioned name on a guy with more wanderlust than sense. But hey, at that point... Solo through hiking the PCT seemed like the height of sense. California to Canada on foot, months on the trail. I couldn't fathom a greater adventure. My buddy Jake wasn't as convinced. He opted for a safe road trip down the coast. We agreed to reconvene in Crater Lake, Oregon, a few weeks later. It was a long parting, but the excitement kept the ache at bay. I thrived on the trail. The solitude, the rhythm of walking, the way starlight looked so big and bright outside of city limits. Sure, there were blisters, bad weather, and nights when loneliness hit hard, but that was all part of the challenge. Up until that point, the worst I'd encountered were a few startled deer. That's what made finding the camp so jarring. It was on the shoulder of a nameless peak in the southern Cascades, a bit off trail, tucked under some gnarled old trees. Wouldn't have even spotted it if I hadn't needed to take a leak. Whoever had been there was gone, but not for long. Ragged a tent, empty food wrappers, cold fire pit. They were sloppy, but also recent. My first thought was maybe some other through hiker in a pinch. Then I saw the stains on the ground. Not rust or spilled food, blood. Lots of it, some fresh, some dried brown. That gut feeling everyone talks about. Mine kicked in hard. Something wasn't right. Getting spooked in the woods is one thing. Doing something about it is another. I decided the smart play was hightailing it back to the trail and reporting it to the next ranger I came across. Only, my feet didn't seem to agree. Curiosity's a powerful drug, especially mixed with a stubborn streak. I convinced myself I just needed a peek, to know what had gone down. The tent flap was open. Inside, it was a disaster. Backpack torn apart, gear scattered like a wild animal had gotten in there. That's when I found the journal. Leather-bound, tucked under an overturned sleeping bag. Now, I ain't one for snooping, but this felt different. Underneath the dates scrawled on the first page, there was a shaky message, it comes at night. My breath hitched. I flipped through, a growing sense of dread creeping up my spine. The handwriting was jerky, frantic in places. They described noises in the trees, the feeling of being watched finding half-eaten animal carcasses just off the trail. Then, a few days back, an entry that ended mid-sentence. It was like whoever wrote it had been yanked away in a hurry. I was about to shove the journal in my pack, tell myself I'd become way too invested in this, when I caught sight of something from the corner of my eye. Movement, outside the tent. My heart leaped into my throat. There, Hunched beneath the trees was a figure. 
tall, way taller than any person ought to be, and rail thin. Its skin looked gray in the dappled light, tight across its bones. It said, Lord, I wish I could take that image back. Skull-like, eyes like black pools, and a mouth full of way too many teeth. It stared at me, head cocked to the side like a twisted bird. Jake? The name escaped me before I could think. Pure, primal instinct. The creature let out a sound, a clicking hiss that echoed in the quiet clearing. And then it lunged. I don't remember much after that, scrambling back, the tear of canvas as I ripped through the tent, stumbling blindly into the woods. Every crack of a branch sounded like it was right behind me. I ran until my lungs were on fire, until my legs gave, until the sun dipped below the horizon and I was lost in the dark. Didn't matter if it found me. I was done. The PCT, the freedom, it all seemed like a fool's errand compared to simply staying alive. I curled up against a moss-covered boulder, and tried to make myself small. When cries echoed through the trees, piercing the night, I didn't doubt they were meant for me. Come morning, the sounds were gone. I staggered back to the trail, eventually hitched a ride to Crater Lake. No sight of Jake, his car was still in long-term parking. They launched a search after I told my story, but turned up nothing. No sign of the camp. No trace of Jake, and absolutely zero explanation from me about why I'd gone off trail in the first place. Folks called me crazy. Maybe I am. After that, there was no more big adventure, just getting by. I stick to city streets now, crowded and noisy. Sometimes, I swear I see that toothy grin flash in a darkened alleyway or catch that black-eyed gaze over the heads of a subway crowd. But it's never more than a flicker, and that lingering dread begins to fade, almost. The Grand Canyon in 1976. That's where it began. Call me Silas, Silas Ward. Back then, I was young, a geology major obsessed with the layers of history written into those rocks. Had this idea of ditching the tourist-clogged trails, spending a few weeks really exploring off the beaten path. It should have been a dream come true, if I hadn't been so damned naive. I set out from Bright Angel Trailhead with a pack full of supplies, a map, and a youthful sense of invincibility. First day went like clockwork, and by nightfall, I'd found a secluded overhang perfect for camp. The quiet way out there, it was something special. Stars brighter than I'd ever seen in the city, silence so thick you could almost reach out and touch it. Almost. That's when the noises started. At first, I chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Rustling leaves, snaps of twigs the kind of stuff that's easy to explain away, alone in the dark. Problem was, they were getting closer. I wasn't tracking some skittish deer. This was big, and it was circling me. I tossed a few rocks towards the sound, hoping to scare whatever it was off. Got a glimpse of movement, a flash of eyes reflecting the firelight. It was upright bipedal but lanky in a way that didn't seem natural, almost insectal with its long limbs. Then it was gone. Sleep was impossible. Every rustle of the wind had me grabbing my flashlight, heart pounding. By dawn, I felt more hunted than hiker. I wanted to radio for help, but what could I even say? That the boogeyman was after me? Besides, my pride was as stubborn as the canyon walls. I'd see this through, even if it killed me. Day two was torture. Every crevice in the rock, every shadowy alcove, they all seemed to hold a pair of glinting eyes. 
I found a handprint pressed into the soft earth near a watering hole. It was way too big for a human, and the fingers were all wrong, elongated, with an extra joint. That's when the certainty kicked in. This wasn't delusion, wasn't some animal. It was tracking me, toying with me. I was sure of it. The question burned in my mind, why? Was I prey? Had I wandered into something's territory? Whatever the reason, I knew staying put wasn't an option. I had to get somewhere defensible, somewhere with a clear escape route. That afternoon, I reached Hermit's Rest. It's one of those lookouts on the South Rim, always swarming with tourists. Safety in numbers, I figured. The creature wouldn't risk showing itself with so many witnesses, would it? That hope kept me pushing through exhaustion. I even started humming a stupid old tune under my breath, trying to ward off the rising panic. It was just past sunset when I staggered onto the paved trail. Breathless, disheveled, and probably looking half-crazed, I expected a curious crowd at the viewpoint. What I found was emptiness. Not a single car in the lot, not a single person on the trail. That eerie sense of stillness settled over me, worse than the nights alone. And then I saw it, the reason for the deserted trailhead. A park ranger lay crumpled at the edge of the lookout. Blood soaked his uniform, his eyes stared blankly at the sky. His throat had been ripped open, the wounds ragged and brutal. Nausea washed over me, then a surge of adrenaline. I wasn't dealing with some big cat or reclusive weirdo. This was a predator, and a ruthless one. Turning to run felt like admitting defeat, but I knew it was the only chance. And then I heard it, the sound of clicking footsteps echoing on the stone behind me. I spun, raising my flashlight. There it was, less than twenty feet away. Taller than any man, hunched over with its impossibly long arms nearly scraping the ground. Its skin was leathery, stretched taut over protruding bones. Its face, its face was like a skull, with jagged teeth and eyes like bottomless pits. The image burned itself into my brain. It hissed, a dry, rattling sound that sent shivers down my spine. Then it moved blurringly fast. I stumbled backwards, tripping over my own feet. The flashlight went flying, and I was plunged into darkness. I scrambled, reaching blindly for anything that could serve as a weapon, a rock, a fallen branch. My fingers brushed against something cold and smooth. The ranger's discarded pistol. I fumbled with it, heart pounding, knowing it was my only shot. Click, 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 the sound of the creature closing and pierced the night. A flicker of movement, a flash of those terrible eyes. I squeezed the trigger. The gunshot split the air, a deafening thunderclap in the unnatural silence. For a heart-stopping moment, nothing happened. Then, a guttural shriek pierced my ears, a sound of rage and pain combined. Something heavy slammed into the ground next to me. Panic fueled my movements as I scrambled to my feet and ran blindly, guided only by the echoes of that monstrous cry fading behind me. I didn't stop until my lungs burned and my legs gave out, collapsing in a panting heap at the base of a juniper tree. Dawn found me bruised, battered, and utterly broken. The gun was long gone, lost in my panicked flight. I should have felt relief, triumph even. But as I stumbled back towards Hermit's rest, despair gnawed at me. Even if I got out, got help, who would believe me? The carnage was just as I'd left it. The ranger's body, that horrific creature nowhere in sight. And then I saw it, the detail that chilled me to the bone, three deep, clawed gouges freshly etched into the stone railing. It had been there, watching me. I reported the ranger's death, but the creature? 
The official story was a mountain lion attack, and I was too traumatized to argue. In the hospital, hooked up to IVs and monitors, I gave a statement riddled with vague language, animal attack, unknown type, the standard cover-up. That part of me, that adventurous, idealistic kid, died that day. The nightmares didn't stop. For years, I woke with that rasping hiss in my ears, the gleam of those inhuman eyes branded on my eyelids. Therapists tried, friends offered comfort, but the wound festered. I abandoned geology, the canyons forever tainted. Instead, I threw myself into the anonymity of office work, seeking solace in routine and crowded city streets. Decades passed. I grew older, weathered, the terror gradually fading into a dull ache. And then, one day, I was scrolling through online news when a headline caught my eye. Unexplained mutilations baffle Arizona ranchers. The photo accompanying the article sent a jolt of icy recognition through me. Livestock carcasses, eerily similar to the ranger all those years ago. The reports mentioned sightings of some spindly, unidentified creature by terrified witnesses. My breath hitched. It was back. Or maybe it had never left. Maybe there were more. Should I have reached out, tried to warn them? That old guilt nod at me. But what use is the word of a broken old man, haunted by a monster most would dismiss as delusion? Still, a sense of purpose sparked within me, something I hadn't felt in years. I began compiling everything I could find, similar disappearances, unexplained killings, whispered legends from the fringes of the internet. I mapped them, drew connections, piecing together a terrifyingly clear picture. Whatever these creatures were, they were out there, lurking in the shadows of the wild places. They might be what the Native Americans called skinwalkers, the Navajo shapeshifters of myth. Maybe they were something older still, a relic species humanity was never meant to find. Whatever the truth, I wouldn't hide from them anymore. I wouldn't let the memory of that ranger and countless others vanish without a fight. The old laptop sits on a worn desk, its screen flickering with grainy images and cryptic notes. Silas Ward, the man who vanished months ago after a sudden obsessive flurry of activity, is rumored to be mad, a recluse driven to delusion by past trauma. Little do they suspect the truth. Underneath the floorboards, hidden in a dusty trunk, rests a meticulously assembled arsenal. Modified hunting rifles, silver-tipped ammunition, tattered field guides filled with annotations on anatomy and behavior of an unknown predator. And there is the map, crisscrossed with sightings, meticulously updated. Ward might have been physically frail now, but his mind, honed by years of relentless research, is a weapon far more dangerous. He is not a man-man. He is a hunter. He is the watcher on the wall, the one man standing between humanity and the monstrous truth hidden in the forgotten corners of the world. The year was 1978, and I found myself deep in the heart of Ozark National Forest, Arkansas. Call me Jasper, Jasper Coltrane, a seasoned hiker with a thirst for wilderness that city life couldn't quench. I figured, why not check out the legendary Timurns Trail, a challenging route that promised stunning views and a good dose of solitude. I was two days in. The trail a narrow ribbon snaking through the dense foliage, had lived up to its reputation. Thickets of oak and hickory hemmed me in alongside sheer bluffs. I navigated steep switchbacks and the occasional stream. I'd only encountered a handful of other hikers, brief exchanges of greetings before we went our separate ways. I reveled in the peace. 
Day three was when things started getting interesting, or rather, disturbing. I was traversing a particularly overgrown stretch when I stumbled across it, a deer carcass. Now, finding bones out here isn't exactly rare. But this was different. It wasn't gnawed clean by coyotes. This carcass was disassembled. The ribcage was cracked open, splayed like a gruesome fan. Organs were missing, and fleshy strips were torn from the legs like someone had taken a messy bite. What kind of predator did something like this? Even a bear wouldn't be this precise. I knelt to examine the carcass, my stomach twisting. There were no familiar claw marks or puncture wounds, just ragged tears. Probably a poacher, I muttered to myself. I knew there were folks in these parts who didn't abide by hunting regulations, but even they wouldn't waste meat like this. The sun was beginning its descent then, casting long shadows across the trail. A prickle of unease crawled up my neck. Best to find somewhere defensible for the night, I figured. Just as I turned to head out, I saw another carcass further down the trail, then another. My pace quickened, heart thumping. This wasn't a one-off thing. Whatever was responsible, it was methodical. By nightfall, I'd found a crevice in a bluff, high enough to see any approaching danger, yet concealed enough to hide in. Settling onto the cold rock, I dug out some jerky, forcing myself to eat despite my churning gut. Sleep came in restless bursts. Every rustle of leaves had me clutching my knife, eyes darting into the inky darkness. As dawn painted the treetops with a pale glow, I reluctantly packed up, unable to ignore the grim scene from the day before. The hike back was a blur. The trees seemed to crowd in, the path narrower than I remembered. With every step, I expected to find another mangled carcass confirmation that whatever lurked out here had a taste for flesh. I pushed onwards, a sense of urgency fueled by equal parts fear and morbid curiosity. Late afternoon, as I rounded a particularly tight bend in the trail, I saw him. He was standing on the edge of a clearing, maybe thirty yards away. I froze, eyes locked with his. Humanoid in shape, but grotesquely tall and lanky. His skin was wrong, grayish and taut, as if stretched too thinly over a skeletal frame. His head seemed disproportionately small, perched atop a long, sinewy neck. The worst part were his eyes, pitch black, reflecting the fading sunlight like polished obsidian. My breath caught in my throat. This was no poacher, no lost hiker. This thing was alien. He inclined his head ever so slightly. Not an aggressive move, more like an animal observing its surroundings. Then, he lowered himself to all fours. My heart slammed against my ribs. With a fluid motion that defied his lanky build, he launched himself into the trees, disappearing into the foliage with uncanny silence. My survival instincts finally kicked in. I whirled around and ran, leaping over roots and fallen branches. My knife felt useless against that, that creature. I didn't stop until the sunlight became a distant memory, replaced by a suffocating darkness punctuated by strange rustlings and snaps. Finding a narrow cave, I wedged myself inside, back pressed against cold stone. Tears stung my eyes, whether from terror or exhaustion, I couldn't tell. The image of that thing burned in my mind, forcing images of those ripped-apart carcasses out. Had they met the same fate? Did it hunt people? The answers weren't coming, and with them came the bone-deep exhaustion. I finally drifted into a nightmare-filled sleep where misshapen creatures stalked me through the dark woods. I awoke to the sound of my own panicked gasps, heart pounding against my ribs. The cave was still shrouded in darkness, 
a heavy silence hanging in the air. Every part of me screamed to stay hidden, to let the creature pass in the night. But another, more defiant part demanded answers. Creeping to the cave entrance, I peered out. Daylight had broken, filtering through the dense canopy overhead. There was no sign of the creature, but the forest floor was littered with fresh tracks. They were large, clawed, and definitely not human. Following them would be madness, yet I couldn't bring myself to turn away. With every cautious step deeper into the woods, the silence grew oppressive. Even the birdsong had ceased. The tracks led me towards the clearing where I'd first seen the creature. Dread settled in, but something else, a flicker of determination, kept me going. The world was tilting off its axis, and I needed to understand why. Reaching the clearing, I saw more than just tracks. There was a nest of sorts, a crude tangle of branches and vines woven into a hollow. Inside, the glint of metal caught my eye. A dog tag, half buried in the dirt. I picked it up, my stomach lurching when I saw the name engraved on its surface. Private Jonathan Ellis. I knew the name. He'd been one of the hikers I'd passed on the first day in. That's when the full horror of the situation hit me. The deer carcasses, the missing hiker, the creature, it all fit together. This thing was a predator, intelligent enough to construct traps, to stalk and capture its prey. A rush of fury surged through me, mingling with icy fear. I had to get out of here, had to warn others. Turning, I bolted back towards the trail, the crunch of leaves beneath my boots echoing like gunshots in the stillness. My frantic escape led me to the main road by nightfall, where a passing motorist, startled by my disheveled appearance, called the authorities. The park rangers initially dismissed my story as ramblings of a sleep-deprived hiker. It was the dog tag that changed everything. A search team was dispatched, and they found the remains of Jonathan Ellis, torn and mangled just like the deer. They never found the creature, of course. It was too cunning, too well adapted to this wild terrain. The official report called it an animal attack, likely a bear, but anyone who looked at the evidence knew. They looked at me and knew the truth the immediate aftermath was a blur. Weeks of questioning by park authorities, doctors, even some shadowy government types who gave off the distinct scent of conspiracy but my fragmented testimony was useless against the relentless tide of normalcy. They couldn't explain the nest, the creature's unsettling intelligence, but neither could I offer any conclusive proof. Eventually, I was released back into the world, but forever changed. I never returned to the Ozark Mountains. Hiking, once my greatest passion, now felt like courting death. The city, crowded and chaotic, became my sanctuary. People glanced at me on the street my tattered clothing, the haunted look in my eyes. I wasn't sure I blamed them. The creature became an obsession, fueling sleepless nights filled with research and online searches for any trace of similar sightings. There were whispers, fragmented stories just like mine. People who vanished in the wilderness— gruesome animal mutilations that defied explanation. A lone survivor of a rural homestead massacre who described a loping nightmare that snatched his family into the woods. We, the marked ones, found each other through coded messages and anonymous forums, pieces of a chilling puzzle that no one else dared to assemble. In those dark corners of the Internet, we debated its origins. A genetic experiment gone rogue? A relic species, a survivor from a time before man? Some whispered about ancient legends, things with names like Rake and Wendigo, that snatched people away as punishment for desecrating the land. I didn't know what to believe, but I knew one thing. That creature was still out there, 
and maybe there were more of its kind. Years turned into decades. I never remarried, never had children. The memory of the creature was a constant shadow, a poison that soured any potential happiness. Yet I couldn't let it consume me completely. That would be admitting defeat. So I worked. I took odd jobs, anything that gave me the flexibility and funds to keep up my search. Technology changed, became a weapon in my arsenal. Trail cams hidden in remote locations, online forums where sightings could be shared. Still, the creature, or creatures like it, remained elusive. But I was building a map, a sprawling chart of disappearances and mysterious deaths that spanned the continent. The picture that emerged was chilling and undeniable we were not alone. My hair is silver now, my body slowing, but the fire in my belly still burns. The old hunting knife hangs above my desk, a constant reminder. Perhaps it's time for a return to the wilderness, one last hunt. This time, I won't be the prey. My name's Brayden, and I'm one of those people obsessed with summiting peaks. Sure, the view is incredible, and the challenge itself gives me this rush. But most importantly, the mountains give me a sense of peace the city never could. That's why I was alone in the heart of Mount Rainier National Park this week. The solitude was refreshing, almost intoxicating. Three days in, I was approaching the crest of Pinnacle Peak. It's a tough climb, even more technical than I'd initially thought. That didn't worry me. I'm experienced and well-prepared. Gear, rations, contingency plans, I take this seriously. Still, around midday, I started feeling uneasy. Wasn't the weather that was picture-perfect, clear as a bell. It was just a prickling at the back of my neck. That gut feeling telling you something's off. You know the one, like the eyes of a predator boring into your back. I dismissed it, of course. Told myself it was the isolation playing tricks on my mind. Funny thing about that climb. At one point, there's this sheer face where you're exposed for nearly 80 feet. The rock is solid, and the view is breathtaking but let's just say it's not for the faint of heart. I was scaling it when I heard the snap. Sounded like a dry branch breaking. I froze, heart pounding. Nothing above me but clear sky. Another snap, louder this time. It came from below, down the slope I just ascended. I slowly peered over the edge. Nothing. I was alone on the rock face but the feeling of being watched only intensified. I cursed myself for being so damn skittish. The rest of the climb was a blur. Every rustle of leaves, every shifting shadow, made me jumpy. I couldn't shake the sense that I was being hunted, that the mountain itself had come alive. It wasn't until I reached the summit that I felt any sort of relief. I planted my flag, snapped my celebratory photos for the folks back home, then radioed in to check on the weather forecast. Nothing out of the ordinary, just clear skies and calm winds for the next day or so. Figuring I'd just been on edge after too long in my own head, I started heading down. And then I saw the footprints. Now, there are loads of trails in the area, but nothing close to Pinnacle Peak. This was fresh, like someone, or something, had passed through moments ago. And the size? Big, way bigger than any human boot I've ever seen. I know it sounds crazy, but the first thing that popped into my head was Bigfoot. All those old, grainy photos. And hell, with how remote I was, who's to say those stories aren't true? My mind raced back to those snaps that presence hanging in the air. Now, I don't scare easy. 
But let's just say I made record time scrambling back down that peak. The unsettling feeling never faded. I kept scanning the ridgelines, half expecting to see a hulking, shadowy figure watching my every move. By the time I reached my campsite, the sun was dipping below the horizon. My original plan? Pack up, get a head start the next morning, and finish the trail before nightfall. But the thought of being out there exposed after dark with whatever made those tracks sent a shiver down my spine. I spent the night huddled in my tent, every creak and rustle outside making me flinch. Every time my mind drifted close to sleep, those huge footprints flashed before my eyes, alongside the chilling certainty that whatever made them was out there. Waiting. The following morning, I bolted. I didn't look back until I reached my car, the image of Pinnacle Peak shrinking in the rearview mirror. I called the park rangers from the first gas station I found, told them about the tracks. Their response was about what you'd expect, something along the lines of, must have been a bear, mixed with thinly veiled amusement. They took my statement, asked a few routine questions, and that was it drove home feeling like a fool. Part of me still believes it probably was a bear or maybe an elk. After all, I didn't see anything. But those tracks, and that sense of being stalked. I know what I felt. The mountains had always been my sanctuary, a place of escape. Now, they felt tainted, dangerous. I can't shake the worry that it knows I saw its tracks. That it's out there, lingering on the fringes of the tree lean. And for the first time in my life, I'm not sure if I'll ever return. A few weeks passed, enough time for my nerves to slightly settle. Rationality started to seep back in. Maybe the whole thing was one big freak occurrence. Maybe the isolation finally got to me. Still, to humor my lingering doubts, I did some digging online. Turns out I wasn't the first. Old forum posts buried reports on niche websites dedicated to strange happenings. There were a surprising number of sightings in that region of the park. Most were fleeting glimpses, odd noises, the same sense of dread. And some, disturbingly, involved people going missing without a trace. No bodies recovered, just unexplained disappearances deep within the national park boundaries. I began searching through missing persons databases, cross-referencing with dates and locations of those old sightings. It all started to click in a horrifying sort of way. There was a correlation. People vanishing on hikes near those reports of creatures. The details were always vague, shadowy figures on the ridges, an unnerving feeling of being watched. It was enough to make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up again. It sounded like something out of a horror movie, I know. I considered calling the rangers back, bringing this information to their attention. But what would I even say? That I believe that people are being snatched by Bigfoot? They'd laugh me out of the station. So here I am. Stuck between skepticism and the horrifying knowledge that something is out there lurking in those mountains, something far more dangerous than any predator I'm familiar with. I want to warn people, to scream from the rooftops about what happened to those who disappeared. But I also know that no one would believe me. They'd chalk it up to a guy who spent too long alone in the wilderness. Maybe they'd be right. 